We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H., or, this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. What was that, Tom? You are about to say I'm something. Already, I'm already futzing with my headphones. I'm like, ah, yes. stop touching your face. You're like showing from like the shoulder up, and you can't see me. I'm like, I'm always like touching my Everything face. Everything is discombobulated. It was I am a mess. I am saying a mess. one, two, three, record, and not actually not, pressing not, the record none button of because stuff. you were yeah. about to clack and click and say pop. And the, minute, the minute that we started this podcast, I realized I have to pee. Uh-huh. What am I going to do? Hold do. it for two hours, man. That's what's going to happen. Uh, no, it's, we get to I talk saw Endgame on Thursday night, so no okay. spoilers for me whatsoever. Because you, um, you would be kicked off this podcast. Of I would never speak to you again as a I human would, being. I wouldn't do I that. I told to my children that if because my son, my middle son, wants to go see it on Saturday with okay. some of his friends. I told him that if he came home and spoiled even the mm. littlest thing, he would be sleeping in the tent in the backyard until I saw the movie. Right. Well, I would just say my impression was I thought the ending was very strong, so strong, in fact, that I think it elevated the rest of the movie, which uh, there were moments in there where I was kind of like, all right, it didn't really need to go on this long. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but no, the, en- I, the ending is superb, in my opinion, and it makes it all worthwhile. And yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's what I've heard, kind of, basically. Okay. That it- is a it's the, well, the end is real good <laughs> the end is real good and i i, I feel like <clears throat> the movie as a whole is like a tribute yeah you know? i i think the people who made this movie it's like a victory lap it is well i don't even know i i think a tribute is is exactly what it is because i think the people who made this movie really love these characters possibly more than i do <laughs> and therefore they're kind of like let's pay tribute to the past 10 11 years and the past 21 movies that came before this one and if there's an idea or a scene that we want to see up there then we're going to do it because by golly this is this is it this is end game so let's do it now that's kind of the way i felt about it yeah, yeah. i was going to share with you an email and i'll do the i think i'll do it off the air okay. from like it's a i get these emails all the time from people who are like Hey, you know, wouldn't you love it if if uh, we have an article that's like one of your articles, oh, and right, therefore yeah. you should cross-link us, and we'll even give you a little bit of money if you or do it. Replace or replace the link in this article from eight years ago with our link. It's it odd. wasn't eight. It was nine. Okay. It was AV rant number 201. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he wants me to go All back. the traffic and, on that that we must Oh, get. yes. And he says, and I, I'll even link you up on yep. our website so that, you know, our 25,000 followers will come over there. I'm like, if to even 201. one of your stupid followers came over and listened to episode 201, which was Cedia 2010, uh-huh. I'm not sure they would be getting the information that you think they would be getting. But be like, these guys are out of date. Has. They are I not know. up on current events. I'm going to go on YouTube and send an angry comment about it. That's right. And, oh, wait a second. YouTube not on our channel work. anymore. Ah. <laughs> Sucks to be you. More important All than right. everything else, I only had time to watch one episode of the second season of She-Ra, which is only seven episodes long in total, so I hope they're going to do the whole DreamWorks animation thing where they bring out like a new season every eight months like they did with oh. uh, Voltron, because uh, that, that was all oh. right. I didn't mind that. I stopped watching Voltron, but Voltron was okay, the ones I watched. Yeah. No, it was real good. Apparently, I haven't gotten to the end. Apparently, people didn't like the way it ended, but whatevs. I like the Castlevania cartoon on Netflix, nope. too. I haven't watched that. that There's right. too much to watch, man. Too there is too much, much to, watch. to watch. Speaking of which, too much to get to as well. Let's let's crack That's on. That's not that much to get to. There's we're, tons we're gonna, to get to. We're gonna skip, I'm going to skip most of these questions anyway, so I'm going to say this. <laughs> Well, I have a new policy. You bore me. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, that's not true. No. We would never do that. We first never... in, first out. That's how it works around here. Ish. Yeah. AV Ranch, your, your podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. We are never bored by you. Um, I was going to say we're sometimes annoyed by you, but that's not actually true either. No. I don't think I've ever been annoyed by a question. No. All the I, questions I think, we get are like perfectly reasonable, good questions. Well, I mean, they all come from a good place. They all come from a place yeah. of, you know, and, and it, it's so. I think one of the cute. I don't want to say cute, like like their child, 
like my listeners are children and I'm like this adult or whatever, but I, I would kind of attribute it to my kids. But, you know, I, it, everybody, when they write their question, they're like, I know, you know, I want you to know that I know these things that you're going to say anyways. Yes. I'm like, yeah, guess yeah. what? We're still going to say them. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it it's going to happen. repeating. It just so we repeating. can make sense of what we're saying in our own That's heads. That's right. If nothing else. But, uh, yeah, all the questions we get are like legitimately. Yeah you know, honest questions. And that's really all I care about. You know, I don't care that you don't know something or you don't understand something. Heavens no, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of the podcast. (laughs) I care that you, you ask it. I'm trying to, okay. Me and my kids are at war right now because dad, dad has instituted a politeness policy. Mm. Oh yeah. It's not going well. (laughs) It's not going well. Must lead by example on that, Tom. I do. By example. I do. Mm-hmm. My son's like, you know, you don't say please every time either, Dad. I'm like, when I have to t- remind you to do the thing that I have reminded you to do for the last six months, I don't say please anymore. You you <laughs> you find something that you've reminded me to do six months in a row, and then and then you can you can get off the pleases too. Until then, you're on pleases. All right, this is Navy Ruth, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. Ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com. Leave a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash avrant, where you can watch us but not comment because YouTube sucks. Yep. It's a necessary evil. It's actually not even a necessary evil. We only do it because it's convenient. Now, I'm looking at our views, and I'm like, there must be people who listen to this podcast who have literally never, ever seen one of our videos. And I'm there's, like, there's thousands of them. You got, I mean, you our, got to check it out. You got to check it out just once, you know, youtube.com slash Avery Come check it out. I don't know that I would want to look at me, Oh, I, not I'm not that. you. Heavens no, not yeah. for that. Nobody uh, looking at us. Well, that's probably why. They're, they probably did, like, see a screenshot at one point, and they're like, well, we don't need Ugh. any of that. And yeah. I'm getting all the audio <laughs> content regardless. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Way, we, and we try to describe things as best we can. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, you want to contact Rob directly, it's rob at avrent.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrent.com. Our Twitter is at avrent underscore Tom. Uh, we'll thank our listeners for the week. To become a listener of the week, to support the podcast in some way, one of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com slash podcast. Mm-hmm. I think. And uh, signed up for to be a continuing sponsor, uh, subscriber. I don't know what you call it. Patron. Whatever Patreon is. Patron. Be a patron. Yes. Be a patron. <laughs> Every month, some money comes from you and goes to us. That's right. Automatically. So it's, li- it's little as a dollar as much as infinity. So we've got 79 patrons want to thank. Thank all of you guys and gals. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash Podcast if you'd like to sign up. And thanks very much to our 79 patrons over there. And if you can't support us financially, that's fine. Just tell us how you did support us in some other way, even if it's just like, you know, talking this up to a friend or something like that. Just let us know that your friend was Bill Gates. Because yeah. <laughs> that'd be awesome. Uh, and we'll mention you. So Johnny uh, talked us up to RBH and Accessories for Less when he bought some EPSB headphones from RBH and a Denon X3400H from Accessories for Less. So thank you, Johnny. Yeah, Johnny, that's great. Congrats on those purchases and thanks for talking us up to RBH and Accessories for Less. And Martin Googled for me and let me know that Season 4 of The Expanse has wrapped up shooting after being saved by Amazon Prime Video when Sci-Fi canceled it because Sci-Fi absolutely loves to get a show popular and then cancel it they dropped That's the ball like on that one thing. that was weird dude that show is so good it's <laughs> not like it's not it's not my favorite show of all time i mean mm-hmm. it's not the sort of thing i'm gonna watch a thousand times over uh and it's not something that i i like because it ticks all of the buttons for me but it's just it's, it was just well made the special effects were like really good the first mm. season and quite good all the rest of the seasons i i just i just don't know and the acting was all pretty decent too so i mean i had tom uh thomas jane on there man he was the punisher but anyways thank you martin for letting me know that uh yes that, that will be airing this you summer did wonder about it aloud last episode so martin was I listening think. and thank you for chiming in martin and yeah if anyone would like to uh donate to the podcast in a one-time donation they don't want to sign up for an automatic recurring thing over at patreon you can just come to our website avrant.com and over on the right hand side it says support av rant and there's a picture of a cup of coffee and that'll take you to paypal where you can use a credit card or your paypal account to send us a one-time donation if you'd like to do so that's right. Let's get some news here. Uh, back at Cedia, which is 2019, not or 2018, not 
Yes, it would have been. Cedia would have been 2018, end of 2018. Yeah. Not 2010 when this dude wants me to link to him. <laughs> Gee, it's so st- The thing was, Rob, mm-hmm. is his, 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 his most recent e- email is, sorry to annoy you again, I promise this is your last email, but you get a chance to take a look at this. And I look to the next well, the, 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 the one. Well, I've dozens of those at the question that Avery had. With, oh, yeah. And the next one ignore them. I junk them. was just a quick follow-up to make sure you got this yep. and confirm I'm a real person, not some automated mm. email robot. And then I scroll down, and I'm like, wait a second. How wh- If you were a real person, why would you want this linkage to happen? Because it's they're not. So stupid. There's, no way, there's no way that an automated system could possibly write those words. Clearly. That's clearly. It's like, it's like oh, a police officer has to tell you they're a police officer if you ask them. That's also true. totally false that's internet that's that's internet uh pl- laws yeah that's the law of the internet it's, it's a gentleman's code because <laughs> everyone on the internet is a gentleman or a lady right. and not a troll which has mm. never never been a thing in the news back at cedia jbl announced a new entry-level speaker series a jbl stage series including models ranging from their 200 dollars a pair of satellites up to 900 dollars a pair of towers there's a 250 pair bookshelf three tower models and two why three tower models? anyways yeah. and two center models 250 each for the centers i guess mm-hmm. how was there's two and they're both 250 dollars they're both 250 dollars they're just different form factors okay including a low profile center that's only four inches tall and uses six three inch drivers to instill i'm um, to still deliver similar extension and output as the rest of the series very positive reviews are coming out now and there's a lot of trickle down design from jbl's flagship m2 monitors particularly the compression tweeter house in a waveguide that seems to be retaining the excellent imaging and wide even dispersion that jbl says they're aiming for so uh white drivers Yep. Kind of, yep. Kind That's of kind cool. of a kind of a hallmark of JBL designs. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people who like older JBL speakers are happy to see those white drivers come make their way back. But yes, the uh, the waveguide on this compression tweeter that they're using that is definitely trickled down from the flagship yeah. M2s, which I'm a big big fan of the M2 speakers. So I love seeing that technology make it all the way down to what is now their entry level series of speakers. And I'm happy to see. JBL bringing out a highly well-reviewed product with what certainly outwardly appears to be a very good design to me. These are using like two and a half way crossovers. So there's nothing chintzy or, or, you know, simple about the crossovers that are inside. These are braced cabinets. They actually have (laughs) separate enclosures for each woofer and that. So they're not cheaping out on any of this. Uh, They're just throwing their considerable heft in the industry around to hit these types of price points with this type of engineering. And I'm happy to see it because I've wanted to be enthusiastic about JBL speakers for a long time. The research that Harman does is second to none, and yet somehow a lot of that has never made it into the regular consumer JBL brand. JBL Synthesis, of course, always had this stuff, but the regular consumer JBL brands seem to not have a ton of that research make it into their actual products. Now they do, and I love to see that. This is a really good uh, solution for people who are either uh, remote and have a hard time... Mm. You know, getting yeah, I mean, access. these you will be able to find in big box stores. Yeah, these will be everywhere. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, or people who are allergic to mail order and sending things back, they don't want to give out their right. you know, credit card numbers yeah. or whatever. This is a good thing, and I really actually, you know, taking a look at this this long thin center. Yep. I mean, a lot of people are would look at that and say, "Wait a second, the drivers are different sizes." You know that the sound doesn't care, <laughs> right? And the, the driver being care. smaller isn't a huge problem like it's going to cause yeah. less wave interference it's just you need the sheer surface area right but that's why they used a whole bunch of them because right. they're small and i like that i like yeah. that they so say that instead of having one driver on each side of the tweeter they have three and it's, so it's that's almost right. like a not like a line array but it's sort of you know and it makes it very very thin and this is a good solution for uh a lot of people who are trying to put their center channel on yes. the little desk. That's right. On the, on the table so right in front of their... So many TVs where there's not enough space yeah. for a even six-inch tall center speaker to fit anymore. Yeah. You have these, have these very uh, slim sound bars if you're going to use a sound bar. And now this is a center speaker solution that, that'll work for that type of situation. I like it, JBL. I like it. Yeah, I have a feeling I'm going to like the smallest of all of these things probably. Yeah. You know, maybe that medi- mid-level tower... The big one looks... Well, the, the smallest of the towers has the exact same driver complement as the regular-sized center. Yeah. So that's kind of where those match up. It looks like the same drivers in the in the medium one, though, too. Mm, is, those is are a really? little bit larger, a little bit are bigger they? diameter. Yeah. So Perian has a new speaker series that will start shipping in July. The Perian Novus series fits in between their Intimus 
in their Varus series price-wise. That's a bookshelf, a center, a tower, and the appearance. First upward firing Atmos module, which can can also be wall or seri- ceiling mounted. It's almost like SVS freaking pioneered that. It, it, this, uh, it is quite simple. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to see uh, multiple companies who are, have these Atmos modules. They're like, yeah. well, you know what? Uh, instead of just saying the only thing you can do with this is put it on top of an existing speaker and have it fire upward, they're like, yeah, there's really no reason why you can't wall mount this thing or ceiling mount this thing right. and have it just play directly and just don't say in your AV receiver that it's an Atmos enabled speaker so that that head related transfer function EQ is not applied to it if you wall mount it or ceiling well, mount it. So take your pick it's very versatile the problem that Aperians always has the top of their speakers are rounded <laughs> so <laughs> right. you're completely hosed if you want to add an atmos these module ones to clearly it not like they clearly have yeah. images of the upward firing version of it on top of the flat topped yeah. tower speaker so that is something you can definitely do i don't know why the center speaker is pushed way back but i also see there are no speaker wires in any of these so clearly this was set up by someone who isn't actually using them but yeah, uh, yeah promo images so the front faces of all the speakers are raked back, and the tower and bookshelves have uh, front slot ports. Uh, tweeter output could be slightly adjusted, and white is a standard finish in, a, in addition to black, which is, of course, you're going to have black in there. Yeah. So they have the uh, the tweeter above a mid-range on their on their center's channel. Yes, which they is do, yeah. something we like to see. Mm-hmm. It looks like the towers have small outriggers, which is similar to what yeah. they have yeah. uh, in their Varus series. Yeah. Um, I mean, aesthetically, I don't love these. Oh, really? To be honest with you, I yeah, quite I th- like the looks of these. To be, uh, I, they're to I've my liking. Like, that's fine. Yeah, but I've never. We're allowed been to a, have different taste. Uh, yeah, you're allowed to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> the the white ones look a little bit better because I don't like that silver thing around the tweeter. Mm, I think it looks okay. weird. I've always not. I've always been not a fan well, of that. Design and that's, choices. That slot port in the front of uh-huh. the tower speaker is just begging for some kid to shove a quarter in. Yeah, it. yeah, that looks not a fan like, of that. Yeah piece of paper coins many things could end up inside of that front slot port and uh i don't have the image where they uh they showed the grill but the grill only covers the drivers not the ports okay yeah Yeah. Yeah. all right some comments from our listeners jeremy porter from a porter uh edwards uh, austin hi-fi shared a sneak peek photo of the first speaker they'll be selling to the public in about six months each cabinet is handmade with components that look an unexpected that took an unexpected three years to source and design. How does it, it takes? Well, he was thinking it would take a. This would be a year long project to design right. and start making these. It ended up being three years. Yeah. yeah. The problem. The okay. And for those of you that aren't speaker designers or whatever, I am of course not a speaker designer as well. But I have spent some time talking with speaker designers, and their biggest headache is not finding a, a tweeter that they like or a driver that they like. Their problem is finding a driver that they like that when they order 100 of them, they're mm-hmm. all the same. Yes, there's that. That's the big problem. And that mostly I've heard that most of the cost and time ends up being the cabinets. That yeah. seems to be a common a common yeah. thread as well. So the cabinets... Uh, come blah, 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 blah. So Jeremy was excited to show off their prototype of Expona this year. So it's a very... Um, Angular, I would well, say. Well, yeah. Many it looks are it, it, if, if the 80s could be made into a speaker... This would be it to me. And I don't say that in the bad way. It looks like it has a slot port, but it's sort of got a cut in down there and stuff like that. Uh, it looks like up front, it's a was it a concentric tweeter? Or is that it just sure a tweeter with looks a... like, yeah, that's got to be a concentric design yeah. of some type. With a big old woofer in it. So I don't know how big these things are. I mean, right. it's hard they to They look really sizable. Tell. Just They do guessing. look sizable. They look yeah. sizable. So... I'm hoping that's a concentric driver because if that's just a tweeter running cross into what looks like like an eight inch woofer, <laughs> I would be concerned about your cross. I think that's point. bigger than an eight inch woofer, to be honest. It could very well be. It looks yeah. like it could be. It's very hard to tell. That but, could be uh, a twelve, to be honest. It's a, I tell you what, you got uh, really. I don't know about twelve. It could be a ten. twelve with like I, that could be like an eight inch around what looks like the tweeter like grill. Could be. Yeah, Could be. I think it's that type of so, size. So, uh, very interesting looking design. You, if you order these speakers, I have no idea how much they cost. You, you, yep. you would definitely know. be the only person that has a speaker that looks like this because they they actually resemble more to me of Wilson Audio. Yes. Than, yep. If you're familiar with them, their speakers Little cost seven hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars. So yeah, they have a they have a similar look to me as those, which is not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. So good luck with those, man. I'd uh, love to hear them someday for sure. 
Graham. Uh, Graham says, according to lots of people complaining online. People complain online? They did. In a shocking twist, they did, Tom. I can't. I've never. I thought online was where we as a society got together to support each other mm. and help and help each other learn from our combined knowledge. Isn't that what the internet is for? It's like the repository of all things good in society? No? There's complaints? There were. Huh. Who would have guessed? Uh, apparently last night's Game of Thrones was too dark. Gizmodo wrote up an article in which they touch upon color grading and mastering, explaining how even on their calibrated OLED in a dark room, things still crushed into muddy gray black until they abandoned the PS View streaming version they were watching uh, on for a much more stable and higher bit rate stream from HBO Now. But the author went on to say that he's, they still hold the opinion that the, that the makers of Game of Thrones messed up in this case because they should have anticipated that most people are watching on uncalibrated TVs that aren't as good as OLEDs in rooms that aren't dim or dark or in using streaming services that are being slammed while millions of people all try to stream the same show at the same time Graham would like us to discuss. I'm not talking about Game of Thrones because I have... Well, I'm, no, I'm, not I the show talk. itself. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, apparently the entire episode and especially the gigantic battle that was taking place, all shot in the dark. In Spoiler! Fact, the, the cinematographer uh, went on record saying that they tried to shoot as much as possible in just natural light with, uh, you know, the current digital cameras that are very good at capturing low light, but basically didn't have, you know, traditional television or movie, you know, lighting going right. on just the actual light that was there in the dark that's what they were shooting in so i mean without question it was a very dark episode i didn't watch it live or anything like that but i you know saw some of the images in that uh but uh there were people who were like a there were plenty of people who said i watched this on my set at home and it was totally fine uh and then there were plenty of people who saw said it everybody in, with vivid mode yeah Go there on. was that there's <laughs> larger larger screenings and that that were going on who were like yeah it was it was okay that wasn't the problem uh it seemed to mostly be people who were streaming it as opposed to watching right. it on their cable provider so the compression seems to have entered into the picture here as well but i mean i saw one person uh like uh the guy who runs ign and that he's like yeah seeing all these complaints i just want to go to everyone's house and calibrate their tv for them because it it is fine if your television is calibrated. <laughs> well, you know, there there's going to be that for sure. Yeah. And, you know, to me, it's like if you're going to stream, you got to be able you got to be willing to put up with some of this stuff. You know, it's going to happen. You're going to be sitting there watching whatever movie you're watching and there's going to be a hiccup as you know but i think part of it is that people see the thing that says this is streaming in 4k or this is streaming in hd and right. most people are not aware of things like higher compression rates and lower bit rates and stuff that doesn't enter they just see hd or 4k and they're just expecting right. a certain level of quality from that alone which well, they, honestly it, the way things are marketed i can't blame anyone for i can't blame them right? for that either yeah. but you know that's also you know, it's like it's like anything else. You know, people, if you want to read the specs on the car and you're mm. going to expect a car or a receiver or a TV or, you know, a house even, really, you know, if you just read what it says on the, the and just take it at face value without knowing what the, some of those numbers mean, it's not going to, you know, you're not going to have the depth of knowledge. You're just, just making, a, you're basing a lot of that on assumptions that you have not researched and uh, don't know what they really mean. So, yeah. I mean, there's that. I, I but think what that... about the notion that the people making the content ought to make assumptions about what the majority of people's setup is like, that it isn't properly calibrated, and you should therefore master your content in such a way that it'll you know be visible to people whose televisions are not properly calibrated? No, I mean, you see, I, 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 I yeah. do not agree with that in any yeah. way, shape, or <laughs> do form. Do we start that, going that... down that road? No, we don't, we don't start going. I mean, okay, so... What you do is what you do when you master audio, right? You have you master the audio with the the with in high fidelity with mm -hmm. your, your best headphones or your best speakers or whatever, and then after you're like, okay, it sounds great. Then you take a pair of crappy or you know mass market headphones or speakers, mm -hmm. and you listen to it on that. And that's what they do. They have with those JBL speakers and the do. Sony uh, headphones. The Yamahas, the, the really Yamahas. ancient Yamahas yeah. before Yamaha knew how to make good speakers. That's right. <laughs> they're like still around. And they're like, okay, how's it sound on this? Is there anything glaringly wrong with it? Right. 
right? Is there anything really off base? And they're like, nah, it's fine, whatever, you know. Like maybe I'll bump the bass up a little bit, you know, just yeah. you know, tweak the bass or something like that up a little bit. But you don't go, you don't start with them and then listen to in the high fidelity stuff and go. But the thing oh, is, well. on the video side, we don't do that we don't do the translatability part of it of watching it back on a poorly calibrated tv they, i mean they they have what they consider to be their consumer television test is like an lg or panasonic oled they're like right. this is a consumer tv that somebody could feasibly have at home but that is also calibrated not as specifically and precisely as their mastering monitor but it's still yeah. way closer to a mastering monitor than what most people actually have at home I'm sorry, I but speakers yeah. are like speakers in spe specifically surround sound is so much easier for somebody to really <laughs> screw it up. I guess. I mean, a TV is not that hard. I mean, you face it towards you, you turn it on, and you change the settings from vivid mm -hmm. to something else. Now, if you don't change the settings from vivid to something else, it's unlikely that you'll be staring at the back of the TV. You will yes. be staring at the front of the TV. There will be a picture coming out of it. You know, it's not that hard to figure that part out. And frankly, if that all they do is they turn on the OLED and leave it in vivid mode or <laughs> change the different, look at it in a different mode, well, I, mean, I, I, I think that's more than enough. I did see one other person on Twitter that I follow who was like, oh, I finally discovered what the gamma control on my TV is for. And I'm like, well, there you go. <laughs> that forced people to learn. but uh, That's right. <laughs> This is more of a uh, sh it's it shouldn't be a complaint about how they're mastering things. Mm. It should be a complaint to the streaming services and compression. There's you know, that. Yeah. Th that that's where the complaint should be had. That's where the anger should be at, not <laughs> at the people. Now, the fact that they were shooting in normal light and everything else, that's a design choice. I mean, yeah. I don't necessarily agree or disagree with that whatsoever. I mean, when they start putting out movies in, you know, telephone, vertical telephone, yep. com you know, picture size that's when i'm gonna be like man screw this i'm out <laughs> uh but if they decide they're gonna shoot it in you know whatever low light or whatever i mean i it's fine whatever that's what you chose i'm sure you had some sort of really hoity-toity reason for doing it that way but you know if i don't like it i just won't watch your movie i had i mean there's problems with dread if you go and watch dread you know there's scenes of that movie that were like the blacks are absolutely crushed i mean <laughs> all over the place it's grainy practically and you, you could just see that, that somebody was like i know somebody in that editing room is going we don't have a better shot than this this <laughs> nope. is what we've this got what we've and they're got. like well, they're like was, not only this is what we got but we out of money hoss we out <laughs> this it was is like the deep. story uh vince gilligan told about when they were shooting one of those episodes of uh, better call saul and they were using uh, at the time it was fairly new to them the digital cameras that can shoot in uh -huh. super low light and they were like they said they were pulling their hair out because every time they shot this scene and then watched it back on their monitors they're like there's this red cast this red hue on everybody's face there's like a nighttime scene out in a train yard and like there's this red cast and like is there something wrong with the camera is there something we can do with the light and there's always this red cast and then somebody finally figured out they're like it was the little led on the front of the camera itself to let you know it's recording it, it was, was shining up, on people it was picking up that <laughs> reflecting off people's faces because that's how sensitive it is oh wow they're like oh crazy. well a little bit of electrical tape solved that problem but it was not it wasn't something they were used to in shooting right. movies and tv so right yeah right <laughs> all right let's get to these questions mm -hmm. here david David is still in the process of deciding on his forever or at least long-term speakers. After following our advice about letting his audition candidates just play, even while he isn't critically listening, and then noting when he what he misses in the sound by its absence, as much as any characteristics that stand out by their presence, he has decided to keep the Kef R series speakers for the time being. Has returned the Ascend Sierra two speakers, and he's at peace with that decision. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic because nor the R series now price difference is pretty big there, or uh no not at no, retail that's a reference, i mean right? he, yeah. he got his r series from accessories for less so in his case they were less expensive than the sierra 2s right but regularly they're not very far apart at all yeah okay so uh since we mentioned the focal electra b series as a, another potential candidate david booked a time at a local high-end dealer to audition some focal speakers at their location the listening room was treated but had a much more diffusion diffusion and absorption so it wasn't super close match to david's room as far as acoustics go but he's quite sure that the focal speakers are not his favorites either mm -hmm. the dealer didn't have the electra b series on hand for audition but they did have their even higher and sopra series which is the one that um it's uh, antibacterial if you touch it, <laughs> uh, which is the same beryllium tweeter and a W cone woofer. 
Okay. He knew the detail and clarity that Rob talked about, but he found himself missing the sound of the Kef R series. The dealer was quite familiar with Kef and said that Kef speakers have some unique characteristics and that if David really likes them, he probably isn't going to favor any other speakers over them. The dealer suggested maybe trying some higher end JBL speakers, but other than that, nothing much is drawing David away from the Kefs. So that pretty much just leaves RBH on David's mind. At this point, he's nearing the end of the window, uh, the return window on the Kef R series speakers. Do we think he should forget about RBH now or just and just move forward and with completing his Kef setup? Will the RBH be so worthwhile that you should go past the Kef return window? You should definitely not go past the Kef return window. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. As much as I, Rob loves Ascend. Yes. And he loves his Sierra 2s, and I love RBH. Mm -hmm. If you've compared the Kefs to Focal, mm -hmm. and you've compared the Kefs to Ascend, mm -hmm. and you prefer Kef, mm -hmm. I'm, I am 100% on board with you saying, I, RBH, thanks, thanks anyways. We're, we're done with our interviews for and, now. And both of us, Tom and I, both of us very much like Kef, and that yeah, R yeah. series is fantastic. Yeah, so yeah, there, yeah. neither of us is going to have anything to say about, oh, you... you could have possibly made the wrong quote unquote choice there. No, no, both of us would be like, "Oh, you got real good speakers, man." And well, they... yeah, not only, I mean, yeah. like that, but you did, you did your due diligence. I think you so. Know? And this is this is one of the things I, I when we talk about like auditioning all these speakers and stuff like that, you you run out of time because you can't mm. like take a week off of work to do this crap. Yeah, you can't. It takes or if you time are to do it. Trying to pay a bunch of return <laughs> shipping costs, you run out of money. Right. Where you're like, you know, at, so, at some point, I'm not going to be able to afford to keep any of these because I'm paying so much in yeah the audition process. I uh, yeah, you've done enough due diligence that I can I feel very confident with mm. your decision to keep the calves. So I would keep the calves absolutely 100 percent, no regrets. I would would never think. That our, I would go to our, I would, I had missed out on RBH. I yeah. would not think that. And in all. your case, you could even, after you bought them, go out and read reviews about the Kef R series because you're not going to find any telling you that they're bad speakers. So right. there will be right. no doubt, even if you do that to yourself. Yeah, don't do that, though. If he does go past the return window, which he's not going to do because he's <laughs> going to keep them, whether that's due to waiting to heal RBH speakers or due to wanting to audition other speakers, how difficult do we think it would be to sell the Kef R series uh, bookshelf speakers privately? Yeah, I mean, it'd be easy to sell them privately as long as you price them low enough. So <laughs> I would, uh, I mean, why lose that money? I, I think just keep the speakers and you're fine. I think so. I mean, obviously, you know, if for however much longer you live on this planet, it is not utterly impossible that there could be another speaker out there that you prefer even more. Uh, but no, I mean, you, these are fantastic. I don't see any reason to to torture yourself any further. You know no, that you neither. like them. You know that when you took them away and listened to something else that you also thought was very good, but you found yourself missing the calves. I'm like, that's that's it. That's everything. Because... Uh, to me, that's exactly what made me settle on Ascend in my case. And, you know, I don't think he'd turn around and say, I'm insane for liking those. It's just a no. little bit different preferences and different rooms no. and maybe yeah. different content that we listen to as well. All types of things can factor into that. I think you've made a great decision here. I mean, if there were... I think you're going to have to spend significantly more money to find a speaker you're going to like. Right. Enough more that you would feel like you should have, you know, gone with these other ones. Right. And that's not in the cards right now so yeah. don't worry about it yeah. all these speakers that are about the same price point you find one of them that you like better than most of the other ones you're good just yeah. stick with that i mean it, it, it's literally it's not even splitting hairs at that point it's the same hair you know, <laughs> yeah even... right along those lines the, the the last thing i was going to say was that uh like when lee was on he made a good suggestion which is that if you only have one or maybe not even one uh, shop around where you can go and audition some speakers that aren't just found in a big box retailer that you know right. maybe you uh, make a weekend of it sometime go to a larger city you know that's you know a bit far it wouldn't be something you just drive to normally but you make a weekend right. out of it you go someplace with a, a place that has more shops and I was saying maybe legacy speakers you know which would be more expensive yeah. yeah, the type you'd be looking at would be more expensive than what you got. So not for really that purpose, but just he was like, I want to hear something with a folded ribbon tweeter and that I'm like, OK, there's nothing better that you could really go to for that experience than finding a legacy audio dealer and hearing some legacy audio speakers. So that would be the last thing I would point you towards, but not really seriously considering them because they'd be considerably more expensive. Yeah. Greg asks, how far off the ground does the center channel speaker really need to be? 
Well, if you're M and K speakers, it can be on the ground because that's the way they used to make them. And not only their center channels, but like all three front speakers would be Have on the ground. Little angles built in. On yep. the yeah, on the regular, you just set, threw them right up there at the front wall, and you're good to go. So. <laughs> All right, Greg's budget won't allow for an acoustically transparent projection screen, but he still wants the largest screen that will uh, fit, given his ceiling height and the vertical offset of the projector he plans to purchase, which is the BenQ HT 3550. He's worked out the figures, and with the 135-inch screen size, he would like to use a center speaker will only be a little over 6 inches off the ground. Is it okay? With simply tilting the center so that it is aiming up a bit and pointed at his seated ear height be enough? Yeah, it'll be fine. That's what I would do. Yeah, That's what I mean, everybody I, does, actually. <laughs> I'm not typically a fan of <coughs> like literally having your center speaker on the floor because you do get a little bit of a weird ground plane bounce at that point. I mean, unless yeah. you are also have your head down on the floor to mitigate that like you would be if you're measuring outdoors and doing a ground plane measurement. I'm not a fan of having it right on the ground, but you're you're it. You're not. You you got yeah. some distance six inches, uh, you know. Normally, I'd I'd like to have like a twelve inch stand. That if, I mean, if, if you I were gonna be others. super neurotic about it, you could take like a panel, like a acoustic panel, mm. and just put it at that first reflection point. Yeah, on, on the, the floor in front of it. Yeah, you could do that. You could. I, I, I wouldn't because I'm <laughs> that dude. That's just way too much. Some people are gonna me. be like, "Why is that thing lying on the ground up there? What? what well, is that? I mean, yeah, something. But who cares? You know, I mean, it's gonna be dark in the room anyways. So, but, but do tilt it so that yes. it is aiming. You know, don't just have it firing straight the forward. The real at issue, your, you know, shins. Would it even reach your knees at that height? Your <laughs> yeah. shins. <laughs> yeah. Six inches? No, it's it's going right into your shins. Uh, I was shooting underneath the recliner. <laughs> yeah, as you as you reclined up. Yeah, that's right. right yeah. <laughs> Recline goes up, and the sound goes under your chair. Well, um, you know, the biggest issue would be is if you had multiple rows of seats. Mm. But the second row of seats is usually for people you don't like anyway. So <laughs> who cares about them? <laughs> Yeah, you know, no, like kids. <laughs> do do the thing. Make sure it's tilted at your face. But uh, we, we're that's okay. It's a it is a slight compromise, I would say, but it's okay. It's not something that's going to drastically. And your you. brain is going to put that sound yeah, sure right will. in the middle of that screen. It is a hundred, like e even when you know that you're looking at the speaker, <laughs> it still sounds like it's coming from the the character's mouth. You just know it. Um, so if you went with a 120-inch screen, the center would be 9 inches off the floor instead of 6 inches. Uh, would those extra inches make such an audible difference that it would be worth sacrificing that much screen size? I don't think so. I mean, honestly, no, I don't think so. No. But <laughs> I would be more worried about how – because you're not telling us anything else. So, I mean, you have a 135-inch screen in size. You're like, this is as big as it could possibly get in here. I'm going to sit 5 feet away. <laughs> well, then now we've got a different issue. <laughs> And it's not where your center channel is. It's mm. how close you're sitting to the screen. So, you know, do, do not get the biggest screen that will fit because it is the biggest screen mm. that will fit. Get the biggest screen that gives you the right viewing angle yeah. for you. If and you are sitting to... 12 feet away, 135 is darn nice. And you right. very well might be sitting 12 feet away. So, Yeah. And we've talked about this many times before, but one of the ways that you can do this is when you go to the movie theater, if, especially if they have a tiled roof. Mm -hmm. You know, count the number of tiles from above you all the way to the screen and the number of tiles across the screen. That's the ratio you like, mm -hmm. wherever you're sitting, you know, and, and not the screen Your itself, but the seat. image, the yeah. image. So uh, just keep that in mind and if that's what you want to do. Uh, da -da -da -da. Anaheim Josh. Josh has been following our advice and putting uh, together his surround sy sound system. Uh, where gaming is a priority and his theater area is just in the corner of a larger room. This is the guy we keep talking off the ledge, right? Yep. You keep, yeah. That's Josh. He, he's sitting. We should, he should, <laughs> ledge Josh. <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting seven feet away uh, from his display and front speakers. We talked him down from an 82 inch edge lit TV to a 75 inch full array local dimming Samsung uh, QLED, which he's loving. Mm -hmm. We got him to stick with an SVS SB3000 subwoofer. Uh, and we convinced him that sticking with his existing uh, bookshelf front speakers is fine while adding new in-ceiling surround speakers since invisible in-ceiling surrounds are the only option in his case. He's feeling good about his setup, but he's got friends who are also in the home theater, and they've been giving him some constructive criticism <laughs> about his decision to continue using his tiny bookshelf speakers as his main left and right, even though his Silverline SR15s are a typical one-inch tweeter with a six-and-a-half-inch uh, woofer design. These friends contend that only large tower speakers will do when it comes to home theater. So Josh wants our take. Your friends are wrong and mean. <laughs> I do not like them. 
<laughs> and they can take their opinions and shove them as far that's my that's my that's my response i'm, I'm gonna i mean it, it's straight up it, it, every word that came out of their mouth was wrong and it did not come from a place of of help i don't think it came from we read it on the internet and we spent money on towers and therefore you should have to spend money on there towers are, there too. are many things that are considered uh knowledge in uh, yeah. in the audio world yeah. and uh, an apple a day keeps a doctor away is also the same type of knowledge as what you are getting right now <laughs> neither uh, true nor helpful we but Tom, apples are Tom good and i went went through all these stages of oh of man the stages the of speaker, <laughs> speaker um <clears throat> excuse me speaker uh believing the, yes uh, yeah you know i mean we've all been there you yep. know Harman Kardon's have real I mean, watts. You'll, you'll see the you'll see the stuff written so frequently in multiple different places by different authors who all seem very very knowledgeable, and it's just taken for granted some of this stuff. Oh, that, you know, a lot of it, a and that's lot why of it. that's why the forums have always been yeah. to us. I mean, that's why we started doing the Q and A part of this. It, yeah. it, first, it was a little bit of Q and A, and then at first it was deep dives, and then it was Q and A. A little bit of Q and A, and then it was nothing but Q and A because, yeah. literally, all I, I, honestly, dude, all we're doing is refuting the internet. That's all we're doing on this podcast <laughs> often, is refuting. Yeah. No, I wouldn't the, say that's all we're ever doing, but all, very often we are. Yeah, we are usually the voice of reason to <laughs> what what you'll get on the internet, which is people parroting things that they've read a thousand, thousand, thousand times. Although I would have to say, uh, quite a bit of what we're passing along uh, does come from Harmon's research, so. Uh, but that's I, research. I have to give credit there. Yep. Well, I mean, we do give credit, but okay. So, and it's not stopping this... them from putting out big tower speakers, is it? <laughs> no, it's not because t big tower speakers sell. I mean, why do you think JBL has got those three different tower speakers? Because people believe that tower speakers have to be had for certain types yep. of. It. I do it's like that JBL's ten thousand dollar each flagships though are a two way speaker. I do <laughs> like that. <laughs> So what? Okay, let's get back to this. One argument his friends are making is that the tower speakers allowed them to set the crossover frequency uh, to their subwoofers lower, that forty-five hertz instead of eighty hertz. They say that is better quality. Nope. Blink, blink. But Josh is arguing that properly set up uh, subwoofers uh, will produce better bass up to at least eighty hertz. So what's the point of rolling it off lower and having the front speakers play down to forty-five? Can we help settle this part of their that part of their debate? Well, we've talked about a hundred thousand times on this podcast, but it, it's worth repeating um, because this this is ex definitely one of these common knowledge yeah. beliefs that is so regularly My held and by people I really really respect are still saying this type of thing so yeah so a 45 is like oh i can cross over at 45 hertz therefore my speakers are better than yours well objectively your speakers play lower than sure. you know, their speakers play lower than yours that's yep. objectively true yep. and if that is your ob uh subjective view of quality mm -hmm. Then yes, quality wise, their speaker can play lower than yours, and that yep. means that their speaker has greater extension, which means it is objectively a better speaker. But in the home, in this, in an actual home theater setup, you don't want the bass playing from your main speakers. You don't want anything or below eighty hertz playing at your main speakers because of how bass interacts with the room yep. that's why that's we take part. it and put it all into the subwoofer because the subwoofer we can move to the place that's best for the bass and your ear i don't care how good their little speakers are or big speakers are or how good they think their ears are they can't tell where that bass is coming from regardless if it's in the main speaker or the subwoofer they can't tell because it's omnidirectional and we cannot locate it i literally just wrote an art read an article like yesterday that was like you know base gets directional you know uh below you know or above like 120 i don't remember what they said sure. 40 hertz or something like that i was like shut up no it doesn't it doesn't get directional <laughs> about, about 40 hertz you don't know what you're talking about. The people are like, oh, you want to get tower speakers for your home theater because 
you know, you want you want that base will get directional, and you need to have you know, the, you don't want to you don't want to be able to show whether it's coming. You know, here well, it's coming from the subway. I mean, interestingly, uh, within a room, since the room's transition frequency, the the point at which the room starts to dictate more of the sound than just the direct sound coming from the speaker straight to your ear before it's had a chance to reflect off of any other surfaces. I mean, that's up at 250 hertz in most cases. Right. So right. ideally. If we could get away with setting the crossover that high without the sound becoming directional and being sure. able to tell that it's coming from the subwoofer instead of your instead of your front speaker, I, I would be setting the crossover that high. But we can't get away with setting it that high without running into directionality problems. So we end up at 80 hertz because that's right around the point where we can't tell directionality anymore and we're well down within the transition frequency of the room. And, and honestly, you don't have to tell your friends to... To listen to us or listen to you. I mean, the research is there. Yes. The research is yeah. out there. I mean, check out the Harman multiple subwoofer optimization uh, white paper because that clearly explains the how and the why of using multiple subwoofers in anything that we would consider a normal room in a house. Even if it's an open, great room, it's still acoustically a small space because... Some of those deep of the, bass sounds yeah. will have to have reflected off of something before they ever reach your ear in one full cycle of the sound. So, yeah, uh, I mean, this is coming from the intuition that the ideal would be since each speaker channel uh, in a recording can be full range, that right. the intuitive ideal would be that each speaker plays full range. You know, this is what the signal in this channel is containing sounds potentially all the way down to 20 hertz or lower. So isn't the ideal that one speaker plays all of those sounds from that one location? I totally get the intuition, and that was taken as common knowledge of what the ideal would be. But we know better now, largely thanks to Harman's research, that we're not outdoors. We do have walls, and those walls are close enough that sounds in the bass have to have reflected off something before they ever reach our ear, and that changes the game. So, there you go. Right. So he says, when he looks at the lineups of most major speaker brands, often the very largest tower model uses the exact same tweeter and mid, uh, mid-range or mid-woofer as the bookshelf model. Uh the only difference is the tower adds additional base woofers and, of course, the larger cabinet. So, is Josh correct to assume that the bookshelf model can actually play as loud in the mid-range and treble as the tower model? I would say this depends. Yeah, that's it's not always the case. You can't just make that assumption and know that's for not, sure you're right. Now, I have seen speakers that opened up. Like, mm-hmm. RBH does this on the regular. Not always, but I've seen that done where literally when you – if you just took their mm-hmm. speaker and sliced off the side, the inside of the mid-range and tweeter, that area, is is all closed off together. Yes. has its own little port. It is exactly the same size and internal cabinet dimension as – the bookshelf. The bookshelf. That's right. And then the the woofers, which are then tacked on, have their own cabinet, which is not necessarily all the way to the bottom of the, the speaker. That <laughs> might be only a third of the way down, mm-hmm. and then and then that's sealed off and it has its port. And then below that is empty space. It's just nothing <laughs> in there whatsoever. And it's it's not it's not a bad design. It is a not good design. It is basically like yeah, it's actually we a made... correct design. <laughs> yeah, you know, you you just don't be. Hey, I've got all this extra space in here. I'm just going to leave it all open. That changes the tuning of everything. It makes mm-hmm. a big difference. So, in a case like that, it may be true that the tweeter and mid range play can handle as much power and play as loud as the bookshelf. But not necessarily. You know, there's crossover right. considerations to consider and other design constraints. They may have changed in order to uh, integrate those woofers into the uh, what would probably be a two and a half or three way design at yeah. that point. Yeah. What you'll usually find is uh, they might use the exact same tweeter and the exact same mid range or mid woofer, uh, you know, between the two. But, um, you know, in the case of the two way bookshelf speaker, that mid woofer is playing down as low as it can, however, you know, low they've designed it to play, which very often is going to be, you know, 60 70 hertz something in that range right? right whereas in the tower design they have you know maybe one fairly large woofer or a couple of you know six and a half inch or eight inch woofers or something like that but those are crossed over at maybe 350 maybe sometimes even 500 hertz to that mid woofer 
So right. that has changed the output spectrum of that speaker as a whole. And so, I mean, what I like to point to, like David Fabricant over at Ascend, he's talked about this a lot on Ascend's own forum because people frequently ask for certain speaker designs uh, using the same drivers that he's already using in some of existing designs. And he's gone into depth explaining why he isn't bringing out certain things. So uh, I'll give the example, like in the SE series, he's got the sealed HTM200 SE, which is the exact same tweeter as what's in the larger CBM ported uh, bookshelf speaker. But these have the exact same power handling. They have nearly the exact same output, but one of them, it's all about form factor, uses two four inch woofers in a sealed cabinet versus one of them using a six and a half inch woofer in a ported cabinet, but they end up with almost identical response. Hmm. And he's like, you know, th this is an example of maximizing what this tweeter can do. And then in that same series, he's got the larger CMT 340 speaker, which uses the exact same woofer at what was, as what was in the CBM, uh, the smaller bookshelf model, but uses two of them and then has a slightly beefed up tweeter. So mm. he's like, in order to make use of having this larger woofer area, not just to play a little bit lower, but to play louder, he also beefed up the tweeter a little bit. And then people are like, well, why don't you make a t uh, tower in that series? He's like, well, okay, I'll give you a, what is just a pedestal stand for the CMT to stand on. It makes it look like a tower, but it's literally the exact same speaker <laughs> just attached to a pedestal stand. And then over in the Sierra Rao series, you know, you've got this uh, ribbon tweeter that's used in the smallest model, the Luna, and then the exact same ribbon tweeter used in the Sierra 2, but he's talked about how he actually had to tamp down the output capability of that exact same tweeter in the tiny little Luna because it only has a single four inch driver in there right. that can't play as loud as the five and three quarter inch driver that's in the Sierra 2. And then when he did make a larger model, well, he beefed up to the larger ribbon tweeter, <laughs> added a mid range driver and a couple of, um, a couple of deep woofers. Now, the exact same driver complement is found in the tower and in the horizon. And then some people have said, well, why don't you make a three-way bookshelf that uses the larger tweeter and a mid-range driver and a single woofer? He's like, well, because then I'd have to tamp everything down. What's the point of that? Just turn the horizon sideways and there's your bigger bookshelf speaker. Right. So it's those right. types of things where you might in some cases have to tamp down the capability of that identical tweeter in the bookshelf model if to make it work with the single woofer or whatever you're using you know otherwise you you, you you've got and extra like, headroom that's built yeah. in there yeah and like you said there might be like a tweeter mid-range and then three woofers let's say yeah, that's right but what, what's really maybe going on is the tweeter and the the tweeters playing with the tweeter was playing you know, probably doesn't change. The mid range mm -hmm. crosses over into the tweeter, probably in the exact same spot. Yeah. But like you said, that woofer, that first woofer that's closest to that mid range, might actually be crossed over directly yes. into that. Yeah. It's playing by itself, and then that again crosses over into those last two woofers. Right. So suddenly, your power handling, absolutely, you know, your, and your amount of volume you can put out mm -hmm. absolutely changes because you're the the woof the the the. the the mid -range defining factor driver, yeah. was that mid-range driver is yeah. no longer going to start breaking up when it's trying to play 60 right. hertz at whatever frequency because it doesn't have to go to that 60 doesn't hertz doesn't have to anymore. go down there It's anymore. going to 500 hertz yeah. or it's going to 600 hertz or something like that, which means it can play a lot louder before it starts breaking up. Yeah. So even though you're looking at the same drivers, you know, it things have changed. Yeah. So last, next, not lastly, because he's got some more. Next, he asks, what would be the reason to ever choose a tower model over a bookshelf model plus subwoofers? Uh, well, first of all, the plus subwoofers is with the book with the, with the tower too. I think we've made that clear. Yes. But um, uh, like we just said, sometimes you're sitting so far away, you need things to be louder. Yeah. Which means uh, that tweeter that tweeter in book, uh, mid range by itself may not be able to get loud enough from your distance. Uh, so you need the 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 tower speaker to do that. Other reasons to do it, you like the way they look. <laughs> You don't want to buy a stand, <laughs> you know. Uh, I I mean, someone gave them to you. I don't know. I mean, they, they, there's a lot of reasons to do it, and but sonically, the only real good reason to do it is so that you can hear full reference volume down to 80 hertz at your seated distance. Yeah, and primarily uh, where you're gonna notice the biggest difference, like if you were to measure it, is gonna be in the upper bass or the mid bass region. Right. Because right. 
there is an instance where you could have a room large enough where some of that energy starts to get lost, you know, just coming out of a small bookshelf speaker. Yeah, it's playing, uh, you know, down to 60 or 70 hertz, maybe even, you know, still it's minus 3 dB at uh, 65 hertz or something like that. And you're saying, okay, this uh, tower version that uses very similar drivers or the same drivers says, you know, it's playing all the way down to minus 3 dB at 45 hertz or something. But, you know, I'm crossing over at 80, so can't they both play similarly loud down to 65 hertz? As we explained, that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes the maximum capability of that tweeter and mid-range driver had to be tamped down a bit because in order to make the minus three decibel point at 65 hertz let's say you had to tamp down their absolute maximum output capability in that mid-range and treble a little bit whereas when you add in those extra woofers that the tw the tower has now that's crossing over at 350 or 500 or something and you can max right. everything out and that helps you fill in that mid bass range that in a large room could start to get lost so there, there can be absolute you know, true reasons why it would make sense in a setup to have it. But by and large, in your case where you're sitting seven feet away, even for those mid bass frequencies and that, it's like, uh, no, you're so darn close to those speakers. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to, to upgrade speakers. I mean, yeah. but to specifically and categorically say mm. you need to have towers for home theater nope. is just incorrect. It's not, it's just not true. You know, there there is no no truth to that statement whatsoever. I mean, I you don't have to have uh, any speakers at all. You have you could have headphones, and they would work just fine for home theater. I just yeah. was listening to somebody the other day talk about it, like, oh, I don't have surround sound headphones. I'm like, what the hell is a surround sound headphone? You know, I mean, they they make some that have like multiple drivers in them. But that's all gimmicks, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Most of the stuff most of the stuff that you want to do with surround sound and headphones can be done with two drivers. It's all processing. And phase. Yeah. It's all processing. So, you yeah, know. If you, Josh, were sitting considerably farther away from your speakers, we might have recommended to you upgrading to a tower model. That very well Or a very nice. efficient bookshelf speaker, That's right. you know, that can get real loud. You know, so those would be the other, that would be the other option. Again, you don't always have to. So he asks, can a bookshelf setup actually be more efficient in the sense that it isn't necessary to purchase super powerful amplifiers to drive the bass woofers of tower speakers? Let me tell you the dirty little secret of home theater, sir. Almost nobody needs an amplifier. <laughs> Almost We're not saying that nobody. there's never a case, but yeah. yeah. Almost nobody needs external amplification. <laughs> we all want it. Sure. We all want it like we want a supercharger Feels in our car. Good. We all want it like we I like I want a calligraphy set. You know, because the, the, you know, those really fancy pens that you have to like, you'll know, suck the ink in with the little <laughs> lever thingy. I want that. I want it bad. I don't need it. And I don't need external amplification. I did need amplification, external amplification for the two speakers that my my receiver would not power. Mm -hmm. That was that's quite literally one of the only valid reasons most people have to buy external amplification is because they want to add speakers and they don't have amplifiers within their receiver to do it. But the dirty secret of home theater is everybody wants it because they are sexy <laughs> and they are cool and it makes you feel awesome to know that you've got two monoblocks that are putting out 200 watts you know into one channel driven and you're like oh yay my speakers are using about 1.2 watts at peak <laughs> oh no you're probably getting up to 10 or 20 at peak oh 10 to 20 you know for where could we ever find that many watts in an av receiver for oh, a 40th I of a second for a 40th <laughs> of a second you're probably using 20 watts tom yeah so yeah it, there, this is also what your statement is, and I know I can see where this argument is coming mm -hmm. in with you and your friends. Uh, you know, you know, you're saying, Oh, you got to get these amplifiers for your towers, I don't have to get an amplifier for my bookshelf. That is true, but there are plenty of bookshelves out there that do require external amplification, mm -hmm. they are normally super expensive because <laughs> you know, only people who have no design limitations would design a speaker like yeah. this or some low enough would, impedance and yeah. difficult enough phase curve low to drive that, or yeah. or using a technology like an electrostatic driver which is inherently hard to yeah. drive you know and then they sit 17 feet away from them there's that yeah you're gonna need you're gonna need Again, distance is a huge part of this yeah. as well yeah uh are you gonna say anything on that no I, that, that uh, was it distance yeah. is a huge thing 
<laughs> if you're going to have the same subwoofers regardless, would you uh, be overpaying to get large full range tower speakers? Depends on how far away you're sitting. Yeah, again, it's a distance thing. It's not about over or underpaying. Uh, but it is about it's it's about getting the right tool for your needs. Speakers right. are tools. That's what they are. And there's, I mean, honestly, if you overbuy by getting tower mm -hmm. speakers, as long as they fit in your room and they mm -hmm. fit the, the space, it's not like they're not playing the sound you yeah, want to hear. Yeah, it's not like you can't turn them down. Right. It, <laughs> Whereas it, it, you could exceed the output capability of some small bookshelf speakers if you're sitting far right. away in a large room and you're trying to crank that mid bass up, you could exceed their capability. I mean, honestly, dude, you're overpaying for everything in here because you've got <laughs> you've got speakers. When you could just be getting, you could pay, spend a couple hundred dollars on a, a pair, two pairs of headphones and a, and a splitter jack for your receiver <laughs> and hand one to your girlfriend, hand one to yourself, and you never have to, you know, you're done. But you decided that you wanted to have, you know, surround sound, and now you're, I mean, the, the, overpaying is a subjective, very personal value judgment on what somebody has spent. You know, what I'm willing to spend on a, a subwoofer or a receiver or a car or a projector or you know a surfboard is it doesn't necessarily line up with what you think is important you know people spent go into bike shops and they walk out of there with you know five thousand dollar bicycles and i'm like dude have you lost your mind i think it doesn't even have wheels <laughs> it doesn't have wheels oh yeah i've got the wheels at home they're you know two thousand dollars a piece I mean, what so that's a value judgment. So I, I overpaying is a is is very subjective. But you know you can get too much speaker for your space, and that can be a bookshelf speaker. Mm. It doesn't have to be a tower speaker. You can get, and we've had this happen on this podcast. Someone's like, I want to get these JTR or JRT or whatever they were called <laughs> with a compression compression tweeter and stuff and i'm sitting six feet away yeah dude have you lost your mind <laughs> those things i mean I, they'll I, always I say they want the dynamics i yeah, you're gonna be able to hear the electrons as they're lining up waiting to get in there they're gonna be like you'll hear them talking to each other are we gonna play today i don't know we're gonna play today i don't know i mean that's how that's how efficient that speaker is so yeah overpaying is very subjective uh nick in the uk Back in January, Nick asked whether he should upgrade his TV, his AV receiver, or his Blu-ray player first. So naturally, we said he should upgrade his subwoofer, which sounds yep. exactly like us. <laughs> uh, as fate would have it, that might turn out to be the case. His BK Electric Electronic XXLS 400 subwoofer, which is nine years old. Boy, that just sounds like a XL. I mean, what's a T-shirt? Is it a T-shirt? Yeah, uh, yeah, extra, extra long stroke. It's uh, going to the peerless driver that's in there. That's what they called it. Oh, yeah. is that what it is? That's, okay. Yep. It started producing a constant crackle and other noises whenever it's powered on, even when nothing is but the power cable is plugged in. He said a short YouTube video demonstrating the odd sound. Do we have any idea what would be wrong with it and whether it would uh, be an easy or an, an, an easy, inexpensive repair. All right, so I listened to this before yeah. the podcast. It's a very strange thing. That it is sounds... not super familiar to me. That that no, precise it, sound that he sent it, in. It's it, it's very regular. It sounds like a it sounds like a clock. It's it's like it's well, like, it's like, like cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's what almost I like think... a heartbeat. It's almost like a fairly like a fast heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. It's what I think. Weird. Well, I mean, so he's in the UK, so we're used to 60 hertz, but yeah. they have 50 hertz there. Yeah, so faster than 50 hertz. It might be faster than 50 hertz, you know, but I, it sounds to me like the the pole piece or something in there, It like the electrical field is unstable and it's <laughs> it's like crackling back and forth. I, don't, like I mean, to me, it, it sounded like a, like a relay trying to, like a relay trying to click over and it couldn't. You know what it sounds like to me? A new subwoofer because that thing sounds Busted possum. Awesome. I mean, that sounds like it sound could be busted. anywhere. I, I think it's in the. I think it's it's. If I had to guess at anything, I would I would guess that it's a relay in the power supply of that subwoofer because it sounds like something is trying to click over and can't, and it's just trying to do yeah. it over and over and over again. So so if I were if I you were know. saying to yourself, I wonder how much is this is going to cost to fix? Mm. I would Google like your subwoofer and replacement amp. Yeah. And see what you found out. Because yeah, because they probably won't even repair it. They'll just swap the amp out. Yeah, and depending on the, and I know this sounds very intimidating, but or maybe it doesn't to you. It does. It did. It does to me. 
uh, swapping out the amp sounds like something that, oh, hmm. I don't want to get in there. But usually it is literally like the same speaker wires that you normally hook up yep. to a speaker. That's what's in there connected to the driver. And then the amp is all by itself kind of self-contained. Yeah. So if you can just get a, 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 a replacement amp, you might be able to replace. You, mm -hmm. That would be the potential fix. But if it's the driver... Then I don't think it's the driver. I, I think I really it. think it's something in the power supply or the amplifier itself. Yeah, it, it's much more likely. There's much more that can go wrong there. Yeah, than other way. it sounds like electrical noise to me. So he's open to suggestions for replacement. His living room is roughly 23 by 14 and a half feet, standard ceiling height. So I guess eight foot. About eight foot. And first and foremost, it's really a living room, so huge subwoofers out of the question. is BK Electronic Sub, which is basically a 15-inch cube, which is not small, but it's not huge. It was already pushing it, so no <laughs> bigger than that. His max budget budget is uh, a 1,000 pounds. Or those liras. That's pounds, no right? No pounds. Yeah. So what do we suggest? Um, so 14 by what? 14 and a half by 23, 23 by 8. That is huge. under 3,000 cubic feet. So you could go with, uh, I mean, it's like a medium-sized room. It is. It is squarely yeah. in the medium-sized room category. So, I mean, a lot of times you can go to almost, new, like, especially uh, audioholics, but, you know, that should give you indication. But there's other, most of the medium-sized rooms are about the same size. So if a sub is rated for a medium-sized room, that mm -hmm. would get, tell you that it'd be okay. Uh you know, of course, here in the United States, well, I would say SVS, yep. uh, probably the 2000 series. Yeah, and SB2000 would be very uh, happy in this room size. And it's actually physically a little bit smaller. It's, it's closer like to being a, like it's, it's a, a 13. 14 to 14 and a half inch cube. Is it so that it's, big? It's quite similar in size, but actually a little bit smaller than the one you already had. But a more powerful uh, amplifier in there, a longer stroke woofer in there with a considerably better driver material that How many they're using pounds in the SPS. Um, it's 800, at, at least at Amazon UK. It's 800 no. pounds for the price. So it's within what he was looking at. Um, so over there, uh, REL is also pretty big too, though, right? It is. And actually, BK Electronic is their OEM. <laughs> so, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> you're not going to get much difference if you go to okay. REL. <laughs> okay. So there you yeah. go. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah, I guess we're saying the SB two thousand because it it checks all the boxes. It's the right size you want. It's got the correct output for your room size, and it fits within the budget you were talking about. So we can heartily recommend that. There you go, Nathan. Nathan's going to go RVing this summer. There's a cute little twenty four inch TV in this RV, but that won't do. <laughs> Dude, is this is okay. Nathan is used to his eight foot screen with the JVC projector in his blacked out room at home. He isn't expecting to replicate those sorts of black levels or performance, but he'll be able to sit about six feet from a pull down screen in his RV. The boy don't play. And <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, my cough is much better, but every once in a while it sneaks up. It sneaks up on me. It hey, I, last time I was sucking down cough drops in between mm -hmm. your questions. Um, he just wants the sheer size. A 75-inch flat panel uh, would be great, but there's no wall space to accommodate that. So a pull-down projection screen makes much more sense. And he's willing to sacrifice 4K and HDR in the setup. So he's looking for a projector that is relatively small, color accurate, has a pretty short throw. Again, he's thinking about 75 inches from no more than 6 feet and under a grand. Uh, you didn't say not loud, so that's good. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's probably going to be loud. <laughs> eh, oh well, there's going to be some fan noise for sure. Yeah, no you're going to be that. sitting awfully close to that thing. Uh, bonus points if it uses an internal, uh, external power brick so that the actual power uh, input plug on the projector itself is a DC input. So do we recommend? I can't uh, help I you with that last part for what I'm going to recommend, I'm afraid. No, I, yeah, I don't know I don't any don't projectors know that, that have external, you know, well, there's that some like of those little, class ones. yeah, those little Pico projectors. Sometimes they do have uh, that. Yeah, I've got a Pico projector, and I mean, honestly, those would be great. It, it, they've got yeah. LED backlights and or you know lights, so they last like a bajillion hours. Uh, but he wanted really accurate color, so you're not going to get accurate you're color. Get you're not, gonna get you're not color. 75, 75 inches would be fine. Uh, oh yes, that would be fine for a Pico projector. So I mean, if you're really, if you're really willing to to compromise i mean those price points would be well under a grand oh very those guys <laughs> very far so and they're quite when they say pico i mean like it's like 
two of your wallets, yeah. depending on the size of your but wallet. But he stressed your in his email how yeah. much he wants truly accurate color that he can calibrate, yeah. and it does not. Yeah, check you're that not going to get that. Uh, you're not going to check that box there. So, so every I... other full size projector is going to have the power supply inside yeah. the case. So I'm going to recommend to you Ben Hughes HT 2150 ST. The ST standing for short throw. Um, now, I don't know, it might be too short a throw because if you're making a 75 inch image with the 2150 short throw, the lens of that projector needs to be anywhere between three feet nine inches from the 75 inch screen to <laughs> That's really four close. feet six inches maximum. So you're going to be sitting behind this projector, which maybe that's fine. Maybe you can literally put this projector in front of you. Yeah. And just there it is. I mean, that this is well, an I RV. Don't know. I mean, so. I, it's an RV. So to me, I'm like, I don't understand how there's not going to be crap in the way. Yeah. You know, but obviously he's got the sight lines worked out. But yep. I don't see how there's not stuff in the way. But if he's got that worked out, then I mean, a little shelf or a little you know mount yeah, yeah, on the yeah. ceiling or something like that or putting it on the ground or whatever or, if, or your your outstretched legs in front of you <laughs> <laughs> on your ottoman that's going to be real stable but the, the the thing is the uh the not short throw version the HT 2050A uh the closest its lens could be to the screen in order to create a 75 inch image would be 6 feet 3 inches and I'm like sounds like you got about 6 feet to work with so that is just too far. I mean, it has to be that close or farther. It, it can be a maximum of eight feet, two inches to create a 75 inch image with the HD 2050A. So I think the 2150 short throw is the right choice here. It has very That's... accurate Rec 709 color. It's got the RGB, RGB six segment color wheel. Uh, you can right. absolutely calibrate it to very accurate 709. It's already very accurate out of the box to Rec 709. So uh, it's it's definitely under $1,000. So other than not having DC input and you Using a regular 120 volt plug, it checks all the other boxes. Yeah, I mean, if it can be six feet three inches, it, I mean, he's but that's the six... lens. You also have to yeah, I understand account for that. the body of the projector. And I don't. Behind that I, I would. I, I would guess the way this is going to work is is when you first walk into the RV, it's usually right behind the driver's seats, mm -hmm. and the screen's going to come down right there, mm, maybe by the driver's seats, which means there's going to be more room behind him. Maybe that would be my guess because yeah. i can't really see how yeah, it's not gonna be six feet wide is it the rv no. inside no he's not, i don't think he's gonna be sitting on the back wall mm. of this thing at six feet so that's probably what's the price on these things uh let's see so the 2050a you're looking at about 700 bucks and then you're looking at about uh what 850 i think on the 2150 short throw something yeah. in so that range. one of those will work for you figure out which one yeah. works. And i mean if you want the accurate that. color and you want the small size and you want something that can do this uh, yeah. that's that's the choice. One of those yeah. Ben Q's. Enjoy that fan noise, dude. <laughs> uh, Johnny. Johnny is using an Epson 5040 UV projector. He's tried the various picture uh, presets in his dedicated fully light-controlled theater. Are in, there any settings we would typically recommend that he change? Uh, I mean, I, there's cinema mode, right? I mean, you've done all yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, on the... 5040 UB, uh, it can be a little bit more involved. And instead of literally going through all the settings because there's multiple picture modes because it does HDR as well, I okay. am simply going to reference you to projectorreviews.com uh, where it's their review of the 6040 UB, which is the, the pro cinema alternative, but they are exactly the same inside the 6040 and the 5040. And uh, they have a calibration section in there where... You actually want to be down at the bottom of the page because they updated that review when they redid the calibration after a firmware update that changed some things. So get the most recent calibration settings that they have. They've done it for an ISF day mode, an ISF night mode, and an HDR mode. So mm. it's it's got all the settings you need, and there's lots of them to go through. So just, just follow along with their images. It'll li literally walk you through what you need to program. So he's got a couple of friends who also own projectors. They've been discussing the idea of all chipping in to buy a color meter to share and help them calibrate their setups. They've been buying the Data Color Spider 5 Elite. Is this a good idea? Is there a different meter they should get instead, or should they just forget it entirely and not mess around with color calibration at all? Um, so color calibrate, you know, professional calibrators, their meters are, they start at like 10 grand. Oh, if you're going that, that high, yep. Yeah, sure. the 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 truly the truly accurate ones, uh, the ones that are that are the professionals use, you know, ten, twenty, 
$25,000 for one of those color <laughs> meters. I mean, they, they're they very, very, very accurate. Definitely not necessary to go to that level, though. No. Okay, so the software that I think even most of them at this point use, unless they're like old school and they don't want to change, is Calman, the Calman yep. software, which you can get for... I guess what there was several hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah, I mean they did talk about bringing out the new uh, Calman Home version, but that, that is was only going to work with that one TV, right? Yeah, you have to get it specifically for a TV, and they don't have any that are meant for projectors. So you'd be looking at the uh, Home Enthusiast version, right? Uh, which I think is about four or five hundred dollars, somewhere in that range. So that's just the software, and the software itself is frankly pretty easy to use, but right. Do, it's not like a plug and play thing, you know. It's easy to use from a professional calibrator standpoint compared to some of the other stuff, but it's it's you still have to have something that generates your you test know, patterns, great your test patterns yeah. and your gray screens and stuff like there that. There are and alternatives the, for all this though that I will mention. So yeah, so my so I mean, you guys are more than welcome. This is my take on it. And Rob will give you, like, you guys want to go down the rabbit hole. Rob, Rob will take you by the hand and lead you straight there. <laughs> I my won't take, go quite that far, but I'll, I'll point you the way. Someone else can take your hand. This is something that uh, we talked about a lot in this podcast about 10 years ago. And it was much more necessary mm. then than it is now. They have gotten so much better at putting out screens that are more yeah, uniform. Yeah, very color neutral. Yep. And uh, and and when I say uniform, I don't mean like uniform f across the panel, but I mean like when it comes out and you put it into a mode that it it looks the same throughout at multiple sets of TVs. Mm -hmm. You know, you you, you kind of know what you're getting. It's a lot easier. It used to be people would share their settings, and I'd be like, "Don't listen to any of that." Right. The settings the unit for to unit one variation TV was so much. But now that's not not quite the yeah. case as much so i'm much more comfortable saying save your money and spend it on subwoofers <laughs> than i am <laughs> uh going out and spending it on the, all this stuff that rob's gonna tell you what to spend it on and i i think most calibrators most people these days will tell you and and this comes from straight from clint who has reviewed thousands of sets he has stopped checking the calibration on, on projectors <laughs> and TV sets when they come in. He's like, it's pointless. He goes, they're like 85 to 90% of the way there yeah. just by going to... You know, and this is across TVs, you know, of just of moderate, you know, moderate quality. You don't have to go, you know, top of the line. He's talking about projectors that are, you know, mid-level projectors, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of stuff. You know, it's just, they're almost there. And he's like, who cares? I don't care, yeah. and I'm the video calibration guy, and I don't care. Yeah, they'll always talk so. about the delta E or the amount right. of error, and we're right. finding these days that as, as long as you put it in, like, the cinema mode, right? that, uh, you know, your, your range of error is, like, three or four, yeah. and the human perceptible level in, in these calibration things, the way they're set up, is that the delta error of three or lower is imperceptible to the human eye, and tons of these now, as soon as you put in the cinema mode, the color errors are, like, three or lower, which right. means perceptibly they're essentially perfect. I mean, of course, a professional calibrator in a grading suite or something will want it even better than that, but for a consumer, there's not a whole lot of need so all of that said, just to answer the questions directly, I wouldn't really highly recommend going with one of the spider ones. They're they're okay if you're gonna do this, you know, once or twice and you want to use the software that they come with because it's a little bit easier to use right. or all that. I'm not gonna say it's a horrible decision, but I would point you to X Rights i1 Display Pro. Uh, you can get them for just a little over two hundred dollars on Amazon, so it is maybe fifty or sixty dollars more than the Spider Five that you were looking at. You're talking about splitting this amongst you know three or four people or something like that, so it's not drastically more expensive. And that X Rite i1 Display Pro, uh, again, it's the unit to unit variation uh, by all accounts much less uh, the just build quality and how long it lasts and how long it remains accurate. Uh, uh, there's been independent testing to show that it's it's leagues ahead of the spider devices. So it right. seems to be well worth the money. Plus, there isn't a single piece of calibration software out there that is not able to use the i1 Display Pro. They all work that, with it. I actually think that's what I have. 
It very I'm, well I'm, might I'm, be. I'm looking over my shoulder at it, and I can't. And Calman's own C6 is based on the i1 Display yeah. Pro. They did their own tweaks to it and sell it under their own name, but that's what it's based on. So I've got to point you there. And then, if you don't want to pay for Calman, because it is several hundred dollars to get the home enthusiast, there is a free software. Um, there's a whole tutorial that I'll link to that's over on AVS Forum, and it's really good. This isn't one of these things that's you know somebody just put something up and, and didn't get it vetted or anything like that. No, these are professionals who put this together and it's a great free tutorial. It's called HCFR. Uh, that's the name of the software, um, the HCFR calibration software. And it's meant to work as far as what your sources are going to be with AVS's own AVS 709 test disc that yeah. has all the test patterns on a disc that you can play in any Blu-ray player. So those, it's all free. <laughs> it's a pretty darn amazing resource. It's not necessarily going to act like a wizard to walk you through it step by step. So you're going sure. to want to follow the tutorial, but it's all there available for free. And it works with x Rights i1 Display Pro. So I would m much sooner buy a uh, microphone from... A measurement microphone? A, do yeah, the audio side, yep. Do the audio side. I feel that there's a lot more benefit that can be had in that than there can be had in this. But if I you, think, it, I, I mean, if, like, it, if it's just a as a hobby and to get into the yeah. tweaking of it, those are great tools to have. And I don't sure. think it's breaking the bank, you know. Yeah. So, all right, Shane. Shane has been using his partially finished basement as his gaming and theater room for several years. He's finally finished the room fully, so he's got insulation in the walls, drywall all around, a fully padded carpet, and proper lighting. He won a contest with a fifteen hundred dollar prize, so he's got about eight hundred dollars to put towards a subwoofer upgrade. Sounds like you have seven fifty, and your wife has the other seven fifty. That's what it sounds <laughs> like to me. That's what that's what about eight hundred dollars sounds like. Uh, the finished room is twenty four by twelve and a half by nine and a half, which is medium size, so nice, mm -hmm. which works out to be about twenty fifty cubic feet. His existing equipment consists of a Marantz SR5005 receiver, Andrew Jones Pioneer front tower speakers and bookshelf surrounds, a Polk C CS1 center, and an ancient subwoofer that came uh, from an Optimus brand home theater in a box. Wasn't mm. Optimus like the house brand of Radio Shack? I believe so. I think I that's what wrong. that was. Yeah. yeah. So you have a base module that is farting around in that room, almost literally. He's leaning towards SVS. I mm. wonder why. But he tried using their subwoofer matching tool, and now he isn't sure which model he should get. 2000. It's something that ends in 2000, and you'll be fine. <laughs> when he said they had pine, pine, Yes, okay. So the wizard is a... I hate that as thing. As one of the bane's <laughs> of our existence. Yes. I as hate that thing. As much as we praise many SVS things, we do not like the they, subwoofer matching they, tool. The subwoofer matching tool takes how much they think your speakers make or yeah. cost, and they match it with a, a, a comparatively priced subwoofer. That's Pretty not much. how you. That's not how you do it. All right. Yep. So he says when he he said they had Pioneer Andrew Jones towers, he said he should get a PB two thousand. But when he said they had Pioneer Andrew Jones bookshelf speakers, it said he should get an SB one thousand. <laughs> That's a very different, and yeah, I, why why can't they just set the thing? We've asked, I, we asked Gary Yakubian directly, like just set just set it to ask what your room size is. I know it's quite <laughs> literally the only thing you have to do. I don't understand <laughs> who came up with this thing. Like some marketing genius is like, <laughs> no, but if they have like B and W speakers, we should sell them SB four. Please enter the dimensions of your room. Here's the subwoofer model you should yeah. get. It's that. Much. It's well, the problem easy. is is that is that too many people have great rooms and they're gonna put That's these right. huge they're dimensions the... and they. they they're or they're only going to put the subwoofer. dimensions of the theater area that they're thinking about. Yes. That well, either way, it does. I mean, it, 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 yes, you're right. But I mean, if they put in dimensions of their, if they put in their, their speakers, it gives the, it gives you an idea of, you know, uh, how much they're willing to spend on stuff. Right. And, <laughs> and, you know, maybe how close they're sitting and that sort of thing. So what you don't want to do is have them have, you know, itty bitty, tiny cube speakers you know in a corner of their their great room mm. and then they put in the whole dimensions of their great room you're like you need a subwoofer you the need, size of your couch you need four <laughs> pb16 ultras <laughs> yes uh so if he gets a pb2000 that will eat up his entire budget and he would not consider adding a second subwoofer after that not consider it 
Yes, you That's will. That's what he said. You will consider it. You just won't do it for a while. With the total cost of two subways versus one on the grand, you could definitely consider uh, upping his budget by that amount. If you were to spend six hundred or seven hundred dollars on the single sub right now, he'd consider getting a second sub at some point in the future, but not right away. So, given his room size, budget, and confusion because of what SVS's subwoofer matching tools told him, what do we recommend? I recommend you get a, a, a PC two thousand if you can. But if you can't, then. Huh. The SB SB two thousand is fine. What? Yeah, SB two thousand in this. And well, I mean, what about a pair of PB one thousands for nine hundred and fifty bucks? The yeah, as long as the footprint works, right? And you yeah. have a big enough room that it shouldn't be too much. But the difference between an SB two thousand mm -hmm. and a PB one thousand mm -hmm. is significant size wise. I mean, I so. would not go SB one thousand in here. That's no. too small. No, it's too small. I. PB2000 is not necessary in this room size so or no. physical size or cost wise. So we're going, okay, there are two models in between the SB1000 and the PB2000. Those would be the PB1000 or the SB2000. So flip the numbers on the things that SVS's tool recommended to you. Flip the numbers to the PB and the SB and get one of those. Now, Either of those choices fits within the category that would allow him to get to either right away or, or soon in at yeah. some point in the future, because the SB two thousand is what it's seven hundred dollars, right? The SB two thousand is seven hundred dollars, so it's close. I think so. But he said he'd still possibly consider it if it's seven hundred dollars, although not right away. I'm I'm leaning. You just you just grab dual PB one thousands right now, and you're done. I mean, it's nine hundred and fifty bucks, one hundred and fifty dollars more than the budget you got to spend, and you've already got duels. I mean, as long as they'll physically fit, like Tom said. Yeah, I'm leaning that way. That's fine. Basically, you know, there's there's a subwoofer in there for everybody, and I yeah, I I, I feel the need to say this every once in a while. I'm going to say it again right now. I do wish we had a like either get the SVS in this size or this one and you know, this other company. Mm. and get them because they have this you know similar output similar prices and there's just nobody there's not, not at not exactly 500 dollars like that yeah. 1000 comes in because everybody else either has a little bit of shipping or they're a little bit more expensive right. i mean when you get to the really high output stuff we absolutely start going to other companies because there are other oh, companies yeah. delivering the same or more raw output at a lower For price less. than sbs yeah. is but in the lower well lower being 500 dollar ish price range yeah, yeah. no that's it Get a couple of PP1000s. Rob on Facebook. Rob would like us to ask us, uh, ask us some basic questions. I almost started asking, answering these questions on Facebook because I yeah. got it at just the right time. And then I <laughs> did it. He sort of talked about the importance of having matching speakers across the front three, but he's seen a lot of setups that are pre-bundled speaker packages where the center definitely has a different complement of drivers versus the front bookshelf or tower left and right speakers. So how important is for all three speakers to be literally identical? Well, okay. It really, I mean, this is this is one of the things that Rob is much more on the bandwagon of let's get all three up front matching 100%. Uh, the reality of the situation is 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 if you have three identical speakers up front mm -hmm. and, and depending on your, your room and how they're placed and stuff like that, they still might not sound identical. They still might not just because of room placement. So... To me, you know, the, the 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 thing about the center channel, the whole reason why you have all these different complements of drivers and everything else, we've been talking about complements of drivers and how how different drivers in the box and you know the shape and all that stuff will change how you voice everything and and every and uh, you maybe tamp down the the tweeter as Rob was talking about earlier. You know, the whole thing with center channels is we had to try to get them underneath a TV. Yep, and you just. It was Can't originally always envisioned as just being three identical speakers all at the same height across the front. That was how it was originally envisioned. But then they're like, whoops, that puts the center right where the television needs to be. Right. So right. something's got to give. Yeah. So they, the, what gave was the shape of, of the center channel. And honestly, I mean, to my ear, most, most of the time, having a... a a well-made center channel matches just fine with the 
speakers on either side of it. I, I just as long as it's well made and well placed, I don't find that there's very yeah. many issues. No, what's important is that if a sound is panning across the front, going from the left speaker into the center, into the right, or vice versa, we don't want it to sound like uh, you know it's a Honda and then a Ferrari and then a Honda again. Right? right. We want it to be Ferrari, 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 or Honda, 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 all the way across three as that sound pans. That's what's important. And sometimes you can achieve that even with completely different brands. You you might have different brand of center speaker compared yeah. to your front, left, right. It's I've still, done that. It's still yeah. possible for that to be achieved. It, it, not guaranteed. It's not necessarily easy. And since we're trying to give general advice, it's usually easier to stick with whatever the matching center speaker is or using three identical speakers because at least then we know we're starting from a place where, well, at least these drivers are all the same or they right, should right, all be right. voiced similarly. But again, just because of room placement, it still might not perfectly match or you might need some equalization to get it there. So the end goal is what we're after, which is that matching timbre, that pan can be seamless going across those three speakers. But do they have to be three literally identical speakers to get that? No, they don't. This is another one of those things that we were talking about earlier about this sort of, you know, folk wisdom of home theater mm -hmm. that, you know, it's a truism that it's best to have the front three speakers be all identical. Right. I, I, I just don't think that's the case. I don't think it's always best to have the front three speakers all identical because then you end up with people who are taking that center, that center speaker, which is another tower speaker because they have towers yeah. on the side and trying to you know, hang it from the ceiling or, you know, <laughs> put it on its side at an angle and a weird thing. You know what I mean? I mean, I, we've seen some weird stuff, man. I've, we have seen speakers that have been hung from ceilings in this, Absolutely. In, in, in this, uh, in this podcast before. From chains. That was crazy, man. It's like, but the tweeters are at your height. I'm like, dude, that is awesome. I would never <laughs> have done that. But, uh, you know, so it's, I, it's true in that, you know you're coming from a place where all the drivers are the same, right. all the speakers yeah. are the same, all that stuff. But yeah. it's not this is, this is literally uh, universal the same, truth. The same speaker, and therefore, if I if there is a timbre difference, we know it's, it's because of the, the room, not right. because of the speaker, yeah. right? So it helps you eliminate a variable for sure. Yeah. One of the reasons why I like RBH so much is I've owned another number of their speakers, and one of the speakers I owned was a budget mm -hmm. center channel which absolutely played beautifully with any speaker that was well made. And if I put it to and if the timbre match changed like when I added a different speaker to my system, I knew it was that, that speaker that was the problem because <laughs> the RBH wasn't the problem. You know, cuz that speaker was absolutely uh just playing neutral. neutral. Yep. Yeah. So, he says R RSL is having a clear out. Who are we talking to again? I forgot. Rob Oh, yes. how did I forget to get that? Rob W or S or something. A W. All right, Rob W. Rob is having a clear out. Uh, RSL is having a clear out sale on their CG23 speakers as they prepare for a new version. So they're selling their 5.1 package that includes five identical CG23 speakers and their Speedwoofer 10S sub for $1,200 at the moment. He'd be upgrading from a Cambridge satellite speaker package with a smaller 8-inch sub. Not a sub, but go on. For the price, is there any better 5.1 speaker package that we would recommend to him instead? Twelve hundred dollars is kind of hard to beat, to be honest with you. It's, it, I mean, I looked at. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go back to having identical speakers up front. Uh, the RBH, the RBH Impression Series. I think they're like what two, one hundred and fifty dollars a piece. Is that right? One hundred and sixty dollars. Uh, yeah, the regular that? Impression Series, sure. Yeah. yeah. So the the bookshelves. So that would be three. So if you bought five of them, mm -hmm. right? So that'd be seven hundred fifty bucks. Mm. And then if you bought a you know, five hundred dollar sub, PB one thousand, you're you're right there at twelve hundred bucks. So yeah, you're at twelve fifty. So well, whatever, twelve yes. fifty. Very close. close. Yeah. So to me, that beats this. Okay. But uh, I mean, I've never heard these speakers. Mm. So I mean, they look okay. Just yeah, looks. Audioholics wise, reviewed I mean. them very favorably. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, no, I that that's if you went with these, I don't think you're getting a raw deal or anything like that. We do like that speed woofer 10s as a yep. four hundred dollar subwoofer choice because even yep. though for five hundred dollars we like the PB one thousand a little bit better. Um, you know, if you got to save that hundred bucks, we like that speed woofer 10s. We think it's probably about the best option out there for four hundred bucks right now and plays very nicely down to twenty five hertz, not to twenty hertz. Um, 
but which is actually a question coming up, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, very similarly, I can give you an alternative that's right in that same ballpark price. I'm going to be pointing at getting SVS's PB1000 as that $500 sub that I really like, and then getting five of Ascend Acoustics HTM200 speakers, uh, which altogether, including the shipping, is right around $700. So you put it all together and you're right at that $1,200 price point again. So Ascend, RBH, these RSL, we're not, we, we'd we be very happy with any of those choices. Yeah, this is a, this is not, a, you, you have not found a bad deal. I'll put it to you Correct. that way. I mean, if you bought these, I would not say, really? You should talk to us first. No, this is this is good. But if you go like, with the, like you said, uh, the RBH or the Ascend, you can get an upgraded sub. So there's that. That's true, which we're <laughs> going to talk about right now. He says, we seem to talk about the 20 hertz uh, like it's some sort of magical number. If you look up the specs of most subs uh, you can buy at retail stores, even the $800 to $1,000 ones don't appear to actually play that low. So how important is 12, 20 hertz really? And how close or how far is the expense uh, experience of a typical $500 sub compared to a sub that truly reaches to 20 hertz? Well, if you buy SPS, your five hundred dollars sub. That's why we reach. like that five hundred dollars <laughs> sub so darn much. That PB one thousand reaching okay. truly down to twenty hertz. FR five hundred sub woofer. Mm -hmm. The name of it is a sub woofer, which means it should be playing sounds that are subsonic, that are below what you can well, hear. Well, technically, just below what the woofer in your speaker is playing. That's why it's below sub but, woofer. But whatever. That's not how I define it. That's not so, our definition. <laughs> That's not our definition. It should be, and yeah, you know, there's not a brick wall fil filter on, on that uh, PB1000. Well, it will play down into 19, 18, mm -hmm. 17 hertz, which is t is subsonic yeah so yeah the, the what, reason the 20 hertz comes up is because that's the threshold of human hearing we can't right. hear anything lower than 20 hertz but we can hear 20 hertz most of us yes. anyway and yep. therefore if you want to hear everything you possibly can hear you need a subwoofer that can actually play down to 20 hertz and that's if you want to feel anything that comes mm. lower than that you have to have a subwoofer that or can do it. just feel because i mean a good portion of what 20 hertz is is physical tactile feeling as well and it's not the kicky in the chest. That's higher. Right. That's like 50 hertz. It's the uh, blur your vision, your teeth start like feeling like they're vibrating. <laughs> you can feel it in your stomach. That you know kind I mean? of tactile. And rumble, you, yeah. You can't get it if you can't play down to 20 hertz. And it, it's fun when it's there. So you ask us, you know, <laughs> we talk like 20 hertz is like some sort of magical number. Well, I mean, the people who are going to talk about other subwoofers is like, well, there's very low content below 30 or 35 hertz. And you're like, yes, you're That's correct. certainly true. I mean, music, basically, there's exceedingly few instruments that play any lower than 32 hertz. That's kind of the yeah. threshold for most musical instruments. So, I mean, you're right. There is very little content, but there is not none. And then, you know, I want to exactly, I mean, it's kind of like saying, you know, oh, your, 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 your tweeters roll off at 10 hertz. Most people can't hear that far above 10 hertz anyway. 10 kilohertz, kilohertz. I'm sorry. 10, 10 kilohertz. Most people can't hear that far above 10 kilohertz anyways. You won't be missing much. I mean, you might say, you're, you might say oh, that sounds fine. Or you might say, wait a second. But what there's a mean? whole octave that I can there's, hear as a human. The, the, yeah, there's <laughs> there's stuff up there though, right? There's like cymbals and bird chirps and you know other noises that are up there. You're like, yep, yeah, they're up there, but you you probably you won't miss them. <laughs> well, I, I feel like I would miss them. Yeah, you know, I mean, I feel like I might miss that. I would might like to have a speaker that can actually play the entire range of human hearing. So while 20 hertz isn't a magical number, it is magical in that it it, it delineates the end of the human hearing it's, range it's a on the low end. Number. Yeah, and both yeah. Tom and I have definitely had systems with subwoofers that could not play down to 20 hertz. Yeah, and then we and got that... subwoofers that could play down to 20 hertz, and we didn't want to go back. That's so right. that's basically wow. that's the, the what's the difference of the experience once you've had it you don't want to go back <laughs> and if you know I, it, we've had people on this podcast especially back when uh hsu was making their uh stf whatever yeah it was, stf one, two two missed whatever that thing. it was yeah. missed that little yeah, guy 350 dollars sub that played bucks. down to like 25 what, 30, hertz. 25 hertz yeah. and we're like close enough for you know that you could save off for that, for that money yeah. yeah close enough but if we would always say, if you got 150 extra bucks to spend, once you get that jelly in your eyes wiggling, yeah. you're like, oh, that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it is a it is a magical number. It is magical in that what it, what it delineates. But yeah. You know, and there's I, plenty I mean, of people who write into this podcast who say we don't go far enough because they want the 10 hertz. That's what they want. 
Yeah, wait, if you think there's no nothing below, you know, down between 32 and 20, there's really nothing below, <laughs> around 10 hertz, man. You cannot hear it. That is just a fact. Yeah. You cannot hear it. <clears throat> so projector versus flat panel. He says he's got a 75-inch uh, Samsung Q6FN. He likes it just fine. He could never go smaller, and he'd like an even larger image. A 77-inch OLED is totally out of the question just based on the price. His room is almost entirely light-controlled, and he usually watches movies at night anyway, but he'd like to keep the cost of a projector purchase to about 1500 bucks. So what are the pros and cons here? His existing 75-inch Q6 versus a $1,500 projector with a 100-inch screen. Um... 100 plus inch screen. I uh, I have a hard time with this one to be honest with you. Mm. Uh you know cuz you for the, your money what you can get when you are looking at a smaller screen like a direct view screen like a direct view versus a projector is a completely different experience. It is a different to me. experience for sure. Yeah, you know, so you when I go to my parents, I'm watching their plasma. I'm like, wow, this <laughs> has a different sort of sharpness to it that maybe I don't really experience in mine. It's not really a sharpness. It's a, it's I don't know. It's, it's contrast. Like the, yeah, it's what it is. It's, it's what exactly. your eyes picking up. It's yeah, that contrast difference. So, you know what you get for with a projector is you get a much lower price per diagonal inch. Definitely. Essentially, yes. that's where that's why the projector is you know king yeah of the i mean that theater. sheer size that just the flat panel cannot match it well it's certainly right. not for the price but getting the con you know it, once you have a flat panel and you're really you know it married to that high contrast mm -hmm. and you know hdr and dolby vision and 4k and stuff you're like you start looking at all those different features and to get all of that and that high contrast as well uh in a projector it starts getting real pricey. Yeah, and fifteen hundred dollars. Four thousand dollars for the JVC. Yeah. To and get that fifteen hundred dollars doesn't touch it. That yeah. kind of black level in contrast. That said, he's coming from a Q6, which really good Q led as far as the native contrast of the LCD panel itself. It's up over six thousand to one, which is about as good as any LCD panels out there get. But it is edge lit. So it really doesn't have any effective local dimming in there. So you're relying on the native contrast of the LCD panel itself, which means the difference in just sheer panel contrast between his existing flat panel and what a really good projector could do is not enormous. Uh, but in terms of sheer peak brightness, it absolutely, of course, you know, it's well over a thousand nits that the Q6FN can do, which of course the projector is going to be nowhere near. So you're trading off sheer peak brightness and some contrast and even a little bit of black level performance when you're talking about a $1,500 projector uh, for sheer size. That's right. that's the trade-off. That's the pro and con. Now, the thing is, we have this lovely new BenQ HT3550 model that sells for $1,500 that is remarkably good. Um, mm. It's got a dynamic iris on it now, so it doesn't have the really gray-looking black levels that the previous $1,500 DLP projectors had. Until you step up to the $3,000 Epson 5050 UB, there's about nothing better in terms of black levels, so that's remarkable. Pin sharp being a single chip DLP, and it can now do very close to the full P3 color gamut. So you're getting the wide color too. Compatible with HDR, plenty of brightness for a 100 inch screen, but of course nothing close to a thousand nits. So right. I don't think the compromise, I mean, if you want the size, obviously you're not getting a 100 inch flat panel for $1,500. No. So if you want the sheer size, the compromise that you're making for a $1,500 projector these days now that the HD 3550 exists is kind of remarkably small. So if the thing you care about most is super bright little highlights in HDR, well, projector can't get you that, but the flat pan panel can't get you the sheer size. So that's about it. You decide which matters more to you. All right. Infinite Gary. Samsung showed an Ultra HD tele, uh, resolution 75 inch micro LED display prototype at CES. So far, that seems to be the smallest screen size they've been able to manufacture while retaining full Ultra HD resolution. But as we've been saying on the podcast, we don't necessarily care about the exact pixel count so much. We'd be willing to have micro LED modules with whatever resolution each module happen to have and then stitch those modules together to make whatever screen size we want, right? Yes. Yeah, I'm down with that. As long as the pixel pitch is small enough that I'm not seeing pixels from my viewing distance, right. good enough. 
So what if there were micro LED modules with the pixels close enough together that they create ultra HD resolution at the 75 inch screen size, but then you used fewer of these modules to make a 55 inch display instead, you'd have higher than full HD resolution, but not 4K, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there would be any benefit to doing that versus getting a 4K resolution 55 inch OLED? Uh, you know, the, the benefit would be that you were now, I mean, these things you like wallpaper. <laughs> you you, you could mean? expand yeah. the size in the future, yeah. potentially, if that's yeah. how they work. <laughs> if that's how they work, yeah. Can't do that they're... with a 55-inch OLED. It's stuck being 55 inches. Yeah, so, I mean... It, it, that's what you know. That's what we're kind of talking about here. Like I, I feel like we're gonna. That's where we're going. We're going mm. with like these almost. You know, I, I picture them like you know when you play with Legos. They had the Lego like grass. Yep. You know those yep. little big square panels yeah, yeah, yeah. that you would snap together. That everything I, else would go on. Yeah. That I feel like that's what this is gonna be. <laughs> They're gonna that. sell these things in like you know twelve inch squares or you know maybe they'll be like sixteen by nine rectangles and you'll just buy the right number of them and then you'll have whatever your resolution is and if you choose to to make one that's 55 inch diagonal and you get the cheaper ones then it, you're going to have closer to 1080p resolution sure but if you buy the more expensive ones and you're going to have closer to 4k resolution but you know you'll still have hdr you'll still have you know the uh, whatever other color in contrast uh specs they have yeah uh, and i feel like that's kind of the direction it, it, that might be going yeah i mean the but, advantages that micro leds are supposed to offer over current oleds is they should be able to get even brighter so the you know well over a thousand nit thing that oleds can't quite do yet uh that should be possible with these they should be able to have even wider color um, yeah. And they sh they should not have any risk of burn in. I mean, that's the big one that everyone's really th going. But of course, at the beginning, they're going to be considerably more expensive. OLED's only getting less expensive, and when these micro right. LEDs come out, they're going to be well more expensive. So, would there be any benefit? Well, I guess the idea is that it could be a bit brighter, no burn in, maybe even wider color, and the ability to potentially increase your screen size by adding more modules. Those would be the advantages. I mean, that that would be if you think about it. That's just, I mean. That'd be fantastic if that was the case. Now, I'm sure the font sim would have screw it up and make it so that you have to you have to buy it in its case or whatever, or you know it'll be somehow limited so you can't expand it later, <laughs> or you have to buy a new module, controller module or scaler or whatever it is. But hopefully not. We'll see. So it's been mentioned that micro LED displays can offer even wider colors than OLEDs, almost the entire Rec 2020 gamut. So if you were to take a real life object, a Coke can or your favorite team's jersey and hold it next to a micro LED display, would the colors on the screen perfectly match the real life objects now? They can right now. I mean, why can't they right now? Well, there are still some colors outside of even the P3 color gamut. Um but more than that, it would entirely depend on what lighting was used to make the recording of that object. Because I mean, the lighting of the room you're in right now has to be the same as the lighting that was used during the recording in order I, I for those a, colors to look the same. So provided you have a, a, a good enough camera yes. and your your TV is properly calibrated, calibrated and the lighting plug is the, the same. The, no, you you plug the camera into the TV. Okay. You take a live shot of the jersey, right? right and right, right. you show it on the TV at the same time. Yes. It should look the same color. Yes. I mean, I, I, at least to the naked eye, it should be identical. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe yeah. that we can't do that right now. Putting aside variables of what the room lighting is and what the camera is capable of capturing. Right. Uh, yes, that should be the case. Any colors that are still presently outside of the P3 gamut that we're pretty good at producing with current consumer displays, uh, th those should look like the same color side by side with the real life object on a micro LED that could actually reach Rec 2020. It's still to be determined if the consumer versions we get will actually do that. But assuming they right. can, then yes. Yeah. So last episode, Rob told John, who's one of the people who called in, uh, that he would never recommend using in-wall speakers in a garage because of his concerns over gases getting into the house. But a lot of people never keep a car in the garage. They just use it as storage or a workplace or even modify it into a theater. If you know you're never going to park a car inside your garage, wouldn't it be fine to install in-wall speakers? Do you know who doesn't care what your intent is? Code guys. Code inspectors. Yes. They don't care what you use your garage <laughs> for. What they care is that it is a garage. Uh -huh. And if you start poking holes in the wall of the thing, they're not going to care that you never park your car in there. 
it's a garage. You can't have holes in the wall. Yep. So, yeah, that doesn't make any difference what your intent is. You have to get your garage. Basically, uh, you have to have an inspector come in and you have to re, you know, get plans, show them the plans, show them what you're going to do. Then they have to inspect everything and yeah. then you can change it into a living space. Depending on like you can't do that here in, in, in Florida, uh, not where I live anymore because of uh, flood zones and stuff. Nothing. They right. can't you can't build anything new that's in a flood zone. And my garage is in the flood zone. <laughs> So I can't, I can't change that into anything other than a garage. And every new construction in this area, there's an entire bottom floor that cannot be living space. People totally go put theaters and oh, stuff. Oh, people do there. it. They do it. It's one hundred percent illegal against and it will code. Not, that's right. It will not be covered by your insurance, and it yeah. could invalidate any claim that you have. But that doesn't stop them. So, yeah, that's exactly no. right. So Tap on Twitter. Unfortunately, Tap has run into problems with his builder during the construction of his new house. Many delays and even some litigation. So now the home theater budget is a bit of shambles. Ah, uh, litigation. That's horrible to hear. We're very sorry yeah, to hear that, Tap. Yeah, yeah, no, man. We're, my wife really wants to redo our, one of our bathrooms. We have a guy that I, I trust. I know. He's done work for my family. I know this guy will do good work. Mm -hmm. That's not that's on it. He's also very expensive. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know. I just would rather pay the guy I know I, that's going to get the job done right. I just would rather pay him than have to even think about what Tap's going through right now. So Tap says he's already bought his speakers, so that's done. He, he, but he was waiting on his projector and his acoustic transparent screen purchase and also waiting on his dual subwoofer purchase. He had the framing for a false wall already constructed, but now he might need to temporarily use ATV for a while. He bought three identical vertical ascend uh, CMT 340SC speakers. Now he's trying to figure out what to do. Should he throw drywall up on the false wall framing? Would a TV look weird hanging on something other than a regular drywall finish? And what about the speakers? Cut holes in the drywall for them? What about his vertical center? Is it too wide for the false wall framing if he turns it horizontal? What to do? Uh, CM. I don't, how yeah. big are those speakers? Are uh, they're they, about like, 22 bookshelves? inches wide, so they're too wide for 16-inch on center framing, which is what it sort of looks like he's got. So why don't wall. I have any pictures here? Why Why are there no pictures? Oh, did I not add that particular one? No. I just had the one. They, they, these were Are you showing it on have, the Hangout? Can we I have see seen it? before. I did put it up on the actual full thing, but... Not not on see. our hangout thing. Oh, I'm not well, going to get into trade of that. Regardless, it's just a frame. It's 16 inch on center. It was going to hold a false wall. Uh, no need to put drywall up on that. Just cover it with fabric. That's just exactly what I would do. I would cover it with fabric and then I would buy a TV stand. <laughs> No. Yeah, or so even the, if you want to hang the TV on the wall, you can still it's still 16 inch on center studs, which is all you'd be screwing into behind right. the drywall anyway. It makes yeah. no difference. I just cover it with fabric. I'd put my three speakers vertically. Yes, maybe your center is too low where for where you would ultimately want to have it, but you know what? This is temporary. Right. So you just put it vertical yeah. in the bay where it was going to go anyway behind some fabric. You do not put drywall up. There's no sense in doing that. And fat, you know what? Fabric can look really nice. That's the whole idea of a false wall. It looks like a wall, but it isn't because it's fabric. So he might need to chop cheap out on his subwoofers too. He was going to get a uh, dual SVS PC 2000s. The basement is wide, open, and large. Are there a couple of cheaper box subs that we would point him to? Nope. <laughs> Uh, if you get if, if you if you have to bring the budget down, I would simply just get a single PC two thousand yeah, for the exactly, time being. Well, that's what, exactly what I would say too. There you you there you're already getting budget subwoofers. I, I know it doesn't sound like it because we talk about SVS like they walk in freaking water, so they must be expensive. <laughs> but the reality is, for entry level full fledged subwoofers that play down to twenty hertz and lower, it's impossible to. Oh, just about impossible to find a cheaper subwoofer than what SVS sells. It just doesn't exist. So buy one, and then yeah. when you're ready to buy the second one, call them up and say, yep. I already bought one. Here's when I bought it. Here's my receipt. Can and I heck, get you know the what? second one? Let them know the situation right now because we've heard how very accommodating they can very often be. So. Yeah. So just let them know, and they will usually yeah. give you that price, that price break that, that you dual, were going to get anyways. Dual price yeah. break, yeah. Well, they definitely will within a year regardless. Right. Yeah. Uh, and we should have saved you some money there, too. 
So, whatever. Jonathan. Jonathan has a 70-inch Vizio M series they got in 2016. He mentions that it doesn't have HDR or Dolby Vision, though, so it must have been a 2015 Vizio M series model. He started to find himself bothered by what he calls patchy areas of the picture. If there's a large section of an image that is mostly dark, he says it looks patchy. And the, the same thing if there's a section of an image that's mostly bright. That, too, looks patchy with some discoloration. Sounds like macro, macro blocking, but that's just me. I don't know. Or, yeah. or compression, but whatever. He's gotten rid of cable, so all of his sources are streaming now. Okay, here we go. And he's got a very solid 50 megabits per second connection, so he doesn't think it's just a drop in bit rate causing the issue. He knows these patchy areas in the past, but now they seem worse. His wife doesn't notice them at all, though, so she's not on board with another big TV purchase. <laughs> If what he's seeing is being caused by heavy compression, he's thinking that heavy compression would err on the sides of making the whole dark, making uh, whole dark or whole bright areas more uniform. Maybe it would be making them blocky, but not to the discoloration and patchiness he's seeing. However, he isn't certain how video con compression handles such things, so could we explain? And could we also tell him whether his streaming services would actually be using higher compression than his old cable TV feed? Well, dude, that totally depends on the station and the service that you're yeah, using. Because I have noticed in... on... In, in general, on that last part, um, most cable TV feeds are between 12 and 16 megabits per second if they're still using MPEG-2. They usually drop that in half and go to 6 to 8 megabits per second if it's MPEG-4. But on average, if it's HD and you're streaming it, they're usually using 3 or 4 megabits per second. Right. So the likelihood of the compression on your stream being even higher than what your cable TV feed was is high it's quite yeah. likely that it is even higher compression on your streaming service. So that patchy blockiness, a lot of times, those of you that are, are, don't know what exactly he's talking about, you would recognize this when you're streaming a movie and like the 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 mountain comes up for Paramount or whatever, and mm -hmm. there's like a, a lens flare sort of thing, uh, you know, like a, a good color gradation stuff. You'll notice some blockiness or some, some patchiness in that. Um, and I mean, I, honestly, this just sounds like compression from your streaming service and your 50 megabits per second no one cares about that man that, i mean they're that's the they, pipe you've got but doesn't mean that's what they're sending through yeah it. that that trickle that's sending through there had nothing to do with the size <laughs> of your pipe you got the big pipe so that you can you can get everything they've got and have multiple things coming through at the same time because you do you know your phone's using it your computer's using it you know everything in, in your house that's that's connected to the internet is using it at the same time as you're streaming whatever this is so you that you know, you wouldn't want to have the full 50 megabits per second coming through just for one movie mm. uh any little hiccup of your phone you know getting <laughs> a email would would cause you know delays or you know a drop in bit rates and that sort of thing so yeah i'm not i'm not a hundred percent sure that he is talking about macro blocking or compression artifacts i'm not completely certain of that so what i would say because this is a set that has full array local dimming but relatively few zones yeah of I looked local it up, it's 32 zones yeah and that can have the effect of uh, what looks like a splotchiness in the backlight with a fairly large uniform area, but it's not quite the right size to perfectly fit within the local dimming zones, which is quite easy when you have that few. Yeah, and it that, can be. Yeah. That can sometimes create this sort of splotchy looking backlight thing. Usually you'd only see it in bright areas, though, not in dark areas as well. And right. usually what you're describing in the dark areas sounds a lot like compression artifacts or macro blocking. So here's what I would tell you to do. I think you do still have a disc player or if you don't, go borrow one and play a disc. I mean, even if it's a DVD, a DVD shouldn't look like this. Right. Um, so play a disc because we do want to tell, is it actually something inherently in the TV? Are, has, has the local dimming, are you having some of the LEDs are, have aged more quickly than others and they're, they're dimmer than they ought to be so you're not getting uniform backlighting when you should be? Is it that? Because it's not utterly impossible that that's what you're talking about. But a disc will let you know if that's the case. If your discs look you know, much cleaner than your streaming sources, well, then you know it's the streaming sources. Yeah. So the first thing I thought too was the backlighting. That's why mm -hmm. I looked it up. Uh, but that's you're right. It's not that blotchiness that what you should normally see is like a, almost a blooming from the lights yes. to the, into yeah. the darks, yeah. which is what the the. the this, and, and I think we we need to kind of like step back a little bit because Jonathan got this TV, you know, when this TV was quite ahead of its time as yes. far as it was one of the uh, earlier 4K resolution ones that existed, and that had 
any amount of of local dimming. That's right. You know, we have we have come a long way in the last couple of years as to the number of zones that we have. So when I say, oh, it's only got 32, at the time, 32 was like you had to spend a lot more just to get 64, which yeah. honestly well, it, still it was isn't that, that or many. a single strip of edge lighting, right? So it was right. Oodles right. better. So, you know, his TV was a fantastic purchase, you know, at the time. And the fact that technology has progressed since then does not make this TV in any way a bad purchase. The other thing is that we have not addressed at all is, does Jonathan have the his settings correct on his TV? We both know that he does. Yes. Yeah. Because we have worked with Jonathan for about a decade now. <laughs> so we know that Jonathan has the correct settings on his TV. This can also be exacerbated by just you know vivid modes and has playing with gammas and doing all sorts of weird things it shouldn't make that sort of blotchiness but i've just seen frankly piss poor tvs mm -hmm. that can't that crush all the black and just right. make it look i mean it, it's awful and uh, there's absolutely uh that's absolutely can be the case that's not the case with this tv not the case with his settings so uh we know from our history with Jonathan that it's got it's probably the source and it's yeah. probably the streaming but do do but, play a disc because we want to make yeah. sure that it isn't the TV itself to blame could it be uh, just in his brain were these patchy discolored areas always there but now he's just noticing them nor can anything other than his sources be causing the issue I mean yeah I mean your TV could be slowly disintegrating in front of your eyes I mean I, I mean all it takes that. is uh, some of those uh, backlight LEDs becoming dimmer than others uneven yeah. wear is yeah. the about the only other explanation but we suspect it's your sources yeah we suspect it. and and you noticing it more I mean could be any number of things mm. you could have I mean he, he, just this... say, he just he got rid of cable and went all streaming and yeah, yeah that adds up that adds up the uh other thing too is I isn't this like his summer house or something like that or it's a place yeah. that he visits Seems, it's not his yeah. It's not his full time abode, so you know, you know, you're going to be a little bit more sensitive to it. <laughs> you know, as you 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 leave, you go home, and you get you have cable, or whatever. You come back here, you're like, mm. it's now all streaming, and everything looks weird. <laughs> like, okay, so he's managed to talk his wife into spending the money to make their theater room into its own. A climate separate climate zone for the HVAC system. At the moment, he's had to use a small fan to keep the small and closed theater room comfortable in the summer, even though the rest of the house is fine. So that extra fan noise has bothered him to no end. <laughs> it's it's going to be about a $3,000 project. So if you were to get a new TV instead, he'd have to give up this separate HVAC zone project in order to fund it. If the patchiness is the fault of his sources on his TV, obviously it doesn't make sense to, sp sense to spend thousands on a new TV to end up with the same problem. So what to do? Well, test it by getting the blu-ray player in there Yuppers. and then just you just have to decide to either live with it or you know watch discs on occasion yeah i guess no yeah. we we suspect it is unfortunately the sources maybe you'll end up going back to cable that's still less expensive than getting a whole new multi-thousand dollar tv well eventually it won't be but yes <laughs> if you were going to give a new tv stick an oled yeah that is a multi thousand dollar tv but then you have to change the screen size and actually he'd pretty much have to change screen size even if he gets another lcd tv since 70 inches doesn't seem to be common any option anymore but he super duper missed the extra five inch if he downsized to a 65 inch scoot your chair a little forward dude it's your home theater <laughs> it would be fine but uh <laughs> no I, you're not going to change your tv i don't think that's what's going to happen here yeah i so. don't see that as the likely outcome uh, of course most of us if he started with a 70 inch and now you got to change you're probably going to go up to a 75 inch and those do exist there are some yeah. very nice 75 inch lcd tvs there's a 77 inch oled if you can afford it but it's seven thousand dollar dues yeah um. jonathan i mean this is <laughs> this is really it, it, it again it's the viewing distance and yeah. i would be Perf I, I, if it were me and it was really I was going to have to go to a smaller TV I would bring it forward I bring the because the, the speaker's all set up for you so you, you bring the TV yeah. forward I, and, I uh, went from a 70 inch uh, LCD it was a, a 1080p completely SDR only uh, LCD TV that I had and I went to a 65 inch OLED and the improvements of the OLED in all other areas besides size were certainly enough that I didn't miss the extra five inches. I don't know if it'd be as large a difference in your case because your existing TV is better than the 70 incher that I replaced in my case, but still a significant difference. You would definitely notice the picture quality improvement if you went with an OLED. And because of that, I think you'd be more willing to accept the slightly smaller screen size. But don't do it. 
<laughs> get the HVAC instead. It's more All right, important. we're either done or we're going to answer Nathan and be done because I'm not answering these. Let's answer Nathan and be done. Well, questions. I'm not here next week anyway. You got to remember that. So, all right, Rob's not gonna be here next week. So, I'm no not here next week. Next I'm week. going on a little vacation with my sister and her family. So, I'm that's for... great. You're gonna see your 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 family and go to the beach or something. What you guys? I'm not exactly sure what we're doing. It's still a little bit up in the air, but we're supposed to be going to a lake place. So. A lake place. A lake. The lake house. Place. Nothing bad ever happens at lake houses and movies. <laughs> it should be fun. It's Canadian lake house. We'll be fine. They'll apologize to you as they're slowly flaying your skin that. off your body. But yeah, I haven't been away. I haven't missed an episode in ages and ages. So this is an event. That's true. Yeah. All right. Nathan has an old uh, Denon 1910 receiver that he isn't using anymore. So he'd like to give it to a friend whose receiver is so old doesn't even have HDMI. But uh, Nathan's friend would like to use the assignable binding post or to power a zone two. The manual for the 1910, I think my parents had this receiver, uh, say, says it's not possible to play the digital audio, audio signals uh, input from HDMI, coaxial, or optical terminals in zone two, playing play using analog connections in stereo. But does that apply to the assignable binding post or does it only apply to zone two RCA preouts? Basically, is there any way to play HDMI or optical audio source in zone two using a Denon 1910? Answer, no. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, exist. no. No, when they say zone two, they mean all versions of zone two and it's simply because it does not have reassignable DACs. Yes, yeah. so the digital with the to analog two. converters do yeah. not exist for Zone 2. And this was not uncommon with receivers for a bajillion years. When Onkyo and... added them, they touted the heck out of it. They're like, we right. have separate DACs just for Zone 2, so you can finally use your digital inputs and play them out of the Zone 2. Everybody's like, oh my god, I lost my mind because I can play. Yeah, it's so stupid. You have to, you have to literally take have your source plugged into your receiver twice. You have HDMI, right. and then stereo yeah. RCAs just so you can play it in zone two. It's it, unfortunately that's just the way it is. So, no. I mean, clearly your friend was not using HDMI audio in his present setup. So. Maybe but I bet this, he was using co coaxial or optical. He might though. have been very well using coaxial or optical, yes. Yeah. That, but unfortunately, no, your 1910 just, it it has to be stereo analog if it's something that you want to play out of zone two. All right, who we got for next week? We have Matt G and Adam G. No relation, but those are the two left on the list for Tom and a mystery guest host to answer next week. Yeah, or... We'll see you in two weeks, which is probably what's going to happen. I don't, I don't have a mystery guest hoax uh, set up. I don't know, how, I don't know who I, I would even I talk to. I did let you know that I would be away. In advance. Yeah, and then you didn't mention it again for like uh, two you weeks mentioned straight. It and yourself I mentioned last it last week. week, and then I promptly forgot about it. <laughs> Whose fault is that? <laughs> no one wants to hear uh, me, just me on this podcast. That's... Well, probably not solo. Nobody wants to hear me just solo either. You do need somebody to converse with. Yeah, it's nice. All right. Well, we may or may not have a podcast next week. Oh, dear. At least that'll fix our bandwidth issues, I guess. <laughs> maybe or maybe not. Why is maybe our people website will be pinging so the website broken? Going, Where's episode 642 next week? And they'll be pinging the website and breaking all your bandwidths. <laughs> Breaking my bandwidths. I'm that, in that's the problem right there. Our bandwidth, our band, breaking our bandwidth. Our, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, our, 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 our podcast is getting blotchy. Our website is getting yeah. blotchy from all the compression. That's the problem right there. <laughs> Hate it when my website gets blotchy. Uh, All right, guys. Uh, if you want your your AV questions answered on this podcast, feel free to ask us. Just email us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our 79 patrons over at patreon.com for supporting the podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash avrantpodcast. If you'd like to sign up, thanks very much to our 79 patrons over there. And we want to thank Johnny for talking us up to RBH and Accessories for Less and Martin for googling what i apparently was too lazy to google <laughs> but i was very excited when i read that and it, and it was like oh i almost like i like jumped a little bit i was like oh good <laughs> <laughs> well johnny congrats on your purchases thanks for talking us up to rbh and accessories for less and uh martin yeah thanks for helping us out and spreading the good word about the expanse yes for av rant i'm tom andrew and i'm rob h now go out and listen to something
Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.